Well, well, hello everybody. Welcome to SkyTour Livestream here on YouTube. I'm Mark D'Antonio as always. And with me tonight, also as always, is Daryl Mason. Hey Daryl, how are you? Hello Mark, I'm good. You? Hi everybody. I'm fine, thank you. You sound a little hot again. Yeah, well, you know. Kind of, kind of buzzy. I don't know why. Um, I have to move the, the mic back. Something's with the mic, but whatever. Okay. No uh, we'll make it work. We'll all dig it and make it work. <clears throat> so I think it sounds okay now. I'm kind of right on the edge. All right. So what we're looking at tonight is, of course, the Orion Nebula. Uh, and it's probably one of the uh, last couple of weeks before we're not going to be able to look at it much anymore. Uh, but that's only because naturally we have a uh, uh, we have an issue here, and that is that Orion is going away for the season. Yeah, Rigel's about to uh, touch the western horizon here at uh, ten thirty at night. And I mentioned a moment ago that uh, Regulus and Leo is transiting by ten thirty here now. Yeah, that's Sarah right. says she can't hear anything. Um, well, it's going out, so, um, I think that everybody else can hear us. If not, they'll tell us. Yeah. Isabella told Vera to, uh, yeah. refresh. I see that. It's all right. Yeah, everybody can hear. We're okay. Hey, Michael Clagus is here. Isabella naturally is here with us. That's great. Vera Lucia Campos from Brazil is with us tonight. Donald Kunzer is here and PG. That's Petita in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania Petita. I like it. And uh, we also have uh, a few other people here with us tonight. Jessica S. is with us. Hi, Jessica. Great to see you out there in the chat world. There's Science Bob here. is with us. Yeah, I mentioned that. Well, <laughs> well, it's worth That's mentioning right. twice. It is, because she does twice the work as, uh, of us sometimes. Um, and then, let's see, uh, that's just the early crowd. You guys are early birds. That's great. Wonderful. So that said, um, I want to just say hello to everybody and make sure that all of you understand that tonight is going to be a wonderful night. We're going to spend time going through and looking at some objects that, well, we've seen throughout the season, but this time we're going to see them. Uh, from a little different point of view. But before you do that, i got to say hi to Daisy and Zoe Amethyst who are here. Hi there, guys. Great to see you guys. <clears throat> are you? Is Daisy and Zoe here? Or is it just Daisy or just Zoe? You know? Hmm. I hope that it's both of you. Yeah. And Renee Cruz. Hello, Renee. Yeah, good evening to you as well. And... So this Orion Nebula, interesting, it, it's it's over 20 light years across. If you think about it, what were you doing 20 years ago? When the light that was emanated from this part of the nebula that made its way across the nebula, it only just got there from 20 years ago. So that's a time scale of the universe, which is really interesting, you know. And it's, it's about 1,500 light years away from us. That means that we're seeing it as it was 1,500 years ago. That you know, I, I gotta say, Daryl, that, that stuff has always, always intrigued me. You oh, know, yeah. How the universe, the, the universe is a time machine. You know. You betcha. Yeah, we see Betelgeuse as it was 750 years ago. We see the Orion Nebula as it was twice that time ago. You know, 1500 years earlier, or 1500, 750 years earlier than that. So that's pretty uh, interesting. You know. Oh, this Nothing... makes me think of the concept of. Uh... Simultaneity. Uh, oh yeah. Which I'm not sure I've got my head wrapped around all the way or not. I mean, you know, what do you call now? Now and uh, <laughs> you know what's what's 750 years ago versus 1500 years ago. Agreed. You know, and it's like it's sort of like um, if you want to hear you know, like a comical part of that. I mean, watch the movie Spaceballs. Uh huh. Right. When. Uh, uh, is it Eric Moran? Aaron Moran? Eric? Eric? Uh, what's his name there? The little guy. Um, oh, Darth Moran. Vol you know, 
Rick Moranis, thank you, uh, Dark Helmet, says, Why did that happen in the movie? Now, sir. Everything you're seeing is happening now. <laughs> when did we... Well, uh, uh, when did we pass this? He said, well, just now. What? <laughs> yeah, and it's that was actually kind of a, a spoof on simultaneity, mm. which is kind of interesting. Depends on your frame of reference, I guess. I think it does. <clears throat> I have to... I'm going to test my settings for the guider, folks. I'm going to let the guide star get captured here, and then I'm going to take a one-minute shot just to see uh, that nothing is out of sorts. If it is, I'll make some adjustments. But other than that, um, I haven't even done the fine focus yet, so this is just going to be a simple uh, testing shot to see if we are in the ballpark for our guiding parameters. Boom, zoom. It'll be a 60-second shot. Satellite there. Did you see already. one go through? I didn't even see it. That that I don't know what that was. Yeah. Wow. If you were still on one second exposures, and it took maybe three seconds across the field. Wow. I must have been looking at the parameters over here and didn't even pay attention. Mm. All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a one-minute exposure. <clears throat> and there it goes. It's off and running. And now you can see the trapezium in there. And while we're getting this one-minute exposure underway, I'm actually going to zoom in on the trapezium just... To 100% and see if we can, you know, see it. And you can see the stars are a little out of focus, and that's okay. We're gonna fix that in just a minute. Um, yeah. But you can see the modeling in there. Once it's in focus, it's even better. But I'll have it focus in just a second. Uh, this is just a test shot to test the guiding parameters. It's a Skyter live stream. Yeah. So the, the over there on the right side here, there's an orange bar that you see progressing. When it fills that area, it means that it's it's done uh, taking the picture. And you can see uh, that it's almost done now. We've got about five seconds left. And then we'll look at what we've got and see if it actually works. It'll tell us if there's any wind tonight as well, because I don't know yet. Okay, so I can see that we're slightly out uh but not bad actually not bad at all let me uh let me take this and reduce our brightness just a little so let's go zoom in i'm gonna go right to 100 percent and we'll see okay so it's a little bit up to the right so i'm going to make some adjustments here does not look like wind so I think we might be okay but I am going to come in here and change from a rate of 12 I'm gonna give it a little bit more authority I'll say uh, 13 and for the up and down the declination you can see there's a little elongated I want to give it a little bit more authority on that too to make sure that it corrects and that one instead of what well, might be 14 I'm gonna go to 15 and we'll see what that does actually Gosh, it took it first clear night in a while how long has it been since we streamed yeah a while yeah you're right I just noticed that um our right ascension looks better now so what I'm gonna do is go back to that um, and set that back to what it was so cuz it it looks like that's perfect so I think this is just the declination shift we need to worry about so I'm gonna take this back to 12 well actually let me leave it for a second just to see what we get Oh yeah, look at that. Lower your exposure time? Yeah, and I gotta refocus. Uh, I'm just getting circular stars. That's all this is about. Okay. Yeah, okay, so... I set declination... Or right ascension, rather, back to 12. And... Now... Uh, we're in good shape, so I can back out. And we'll go back to... Auto. And we're going to go from this down to one second for now. All right. 
And now, that's beautiful. Let's now give us a little uh, enhanced brightness. You can really see the color. The color looks nice right here when we do this. Um, and now, let's go to 100%. There is another fast moving satellite. Zoom right through. Okay, and what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna move the focus to an obvious out of focus position. I see Barney. Oh, don't even say that. I, do. <laughs> I don't see. I don't see Barney. Okay, I believe you. Okay, um, I'm going to come in and focus now. He's belching. <clears throat> We'll figure that out in a minute. I want to see what you're talking about. But first, uh, I'm going to take and I'm going to scan inward now. And we're going to let the focus system take over here. Yeah. Okay, focusing is underway. You can see the stars being selected for focus. And as the stars get more and more focused, it's gonna build a curve, as I've mentioned a few times. And that curve is gonna look like this. And the bottom of that curve, that's the finest focus position. Um, and then it's going to go all the way up the other side of the curve and go back out of focus, leaving a full curve. And then it's gonna zip back down to that best position for the focus. You can see it's starting to form already down here. So, and now it's back out of focus. We're at step eight, nine of 12, and our curve is being made. Here's the best focus right there. All right, and then we get a green bar up here, 10 of 12, it's looking to do more samples. And then we'll watch when we tell it to go to the best focus position and we will be able to see coming up right after two more there we go. So now there's our position. And now we set the best focus. And you're going to watch this bar come all the way across, go to the other side, go back out of focus, and come back in and find the right focus. And here it comes. And there we go. And now you see we've got nice, beautiful, focused stars. And that's what I love about this system. We can just automatically focus our system like crazy. And I love it. And then we're going to use our temperature correction system to actually maintain the focus as the temperature changes out there. Temperatures are approaching 90 degrees out there, uh, just so you know. Uh, so it's getting warm out there already. Um. <clears throat> Michael Clegan says, I have to walk 50 feet to make adjustments back and forth. Well, I used to, Mike, you know, and then I realized I don't want to walk out and, and, and sit in a 20 degree dome anymore. You know, and that was when for Sky Tour East here, you know, that telescope's behind me, which you guys have seen before. Um, but, you know, 20 degrees is just no fun. Uh, I literally had my, my, my voice was chattering in there. My teeth were chattering, going, and this, this, this is the Orion Nebula. <laughs> uh, you light know. Light. Yeah, right. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I accept. I've, I've set up several times back in the day at uh, minus 10 Fahrenheit. Okay, but notice, folks, what he said. Let's be fair. Back in the day. Yeah. yeah. When I lived okay, up well, in back Glenville. In a, back in the I day. Here. Yeah, back in the day, I also set up in, in negative temperatures as well, thinking it I'm was, a trooper. It was like <clears throat> Ralphie's little brother in Christmas Story, though. I was so dressed up in layers, I looked like a tick about to pop. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's a that's a difficult image. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We're going to do a uh, forty second shot here, and and we'll we'll stack this. Okay. This is not the whole view. This is just a zoomed in portion of the view. We're not even at a hundred percent on the on the sensor. If we actually go to the full size of the sensor. Okay, this is the native size that you're about to see. Okay, this right here, that's the native size of the sensor. 
okay it extends off the page in both directions wildly but when i hit you know this, this auto feature it allows us to fit it on the page so you can see the whole frame of the camera that's what that's about okay and there we go now um and we are stacking, so let me go to 40% here. Yeah, don't worry about that. I will fix that in a second. That's uh, because the stack doesn't have uh, any information about the uh, uh, last known good position. We don't have a color correction, which I am just doing now. So now you'll see a color correction. And then you can see a, um, I'm going to do now a, uh, processing correction to actually show data a little bit more reasonably so we're going to shift these levels around so there we go and now I take this guy off which we didn't want in the first place and then you'll see it's beautiful look at that ah how can you argue with this is such a beautiful sight look at these little tendrils right here my gosh these are just beautiful satellite track right there by that tendril too Mm-hmm. That's right. Busy, busy. I know. I mean, just... But just look at all this stuff right here. This is really interesting dark interstellar dust. Okay? These little tiny uh, dust particles, there's obviously many trillions of them. Okay? Our little tendril is right here. It looks like a little worm, doesn't it? And we will zoom in on this. But that is made up probably of uh, silica dust... Um, you know, with silicon with other materials uh, combined with it. There's probably ice on the surface of these dust particles. And that ice, uh, you know, will melt when in the presence of hot stars like the things in here that are powering this whole nebula. And that dust will then uh, melt uh, off those layers of material. Those other layers of ices like methanol, formaldehyde, carbon dioxide, water ices, and so forth. And they'll end up free. Uh, floating in this cloud and basically what's happening is this cloud is becoming uh, a, a slurry of planet and star making material and so that's why these dark nebulae are the most important places in the universe to me because that's where all the action really happens that's where stars come from is these dark nebulae because before there were any stars there were only dark nebulae okay nebulae with dust nebulae with gas we're seeing both. Okay, this is actually a really good exposure. If you look, you know, if you look at the gain, I have it at 300 right now. And we're going to leave it at 300. But this is just a 40-second exposure, you know. And uh, I'm going to name this, uh, but I don't think I need to. I think it'll be in here. It'll be Measure 41. Uh, I'm sorry, M42. There it is. Okay. And that's the Orion Nebula. It's an emission nebula, an EN, and a reflection nebula, RN. Now, what do I mean uh, emission nebula? Well, all this is emission nebula right here. Okay. The hydrogen gas in here is glowing red because of the hot stars that we talked about in the middle here. And then above it, all right, uh, we have this as well, which we'll get to in a sec. But this stuff here, this is actually glowing oxygen. And it's a bluish green and that bluish green color is a characteristic of what happens when uh, hot stars with their ultraviolet energy ionize oxygen atoms in a nebula. I'm going to do a color correction here and get that back a little bit more. There we go. That's a little bit more proper. All right. So when we look at this, okay, now we come up here and we see a reflection nebula. Notice it's blue. It's not greenish blue. It's blue. And that blue is um, the dark dust scattering the starlight that's inside this nebula, okay, inside here, this, these young stars. It's scattering the dust in the same way that a, a volcanic dust in the atmosphere scatters the blue light from the sun, making the sunsets look very, very red, right? So, um, and that's, uh, again, Rayleigh scattering, as Daryl has mentioned before, as I've mentioned before. It's a, a, a process that happens in our atmosphere, which is why our sky looks blue. It's a universal process. It happens everywhere. So let's uh, let's increase a little bit 
of our view into this. Let's kind of pop up a little bit of the values here. Yeah. I dare say, Daryl, this is really one of the nicest looking uh, Orion Nebulas that we've actually created, I think. Oh, yeah. Look at all these beautiful tentacles. Let's do a processing thing here. It's going to brighten up a little more. Okay, I'm going to bring it back down, but I just want to do this to show some of the other details that are in here. You'll notice you can see some real streaks in here. These, again, keep in mind, it took over 20 years for light to go from here to here in this nebula. It's one of the closest ones to us, too. But it's stunning. Yeah, and Daryl says in chat, M43 is the upper left part of the nebula. That's this guy right here. Yep. Measure 43. Now, is that Barney? Or is Barney over here somewhere? Uh, you can't see Barney. It's overexposed. You need to be back down around a one second exposure. Okay. All right. If you say so, well, I believe you. <laughs> Let's, uh,. Take our black level over just to darken space a little bit more, shall we? And it'll help show those brown clouds of dust, interstellar dust. There we go. Look at that. You can really see the clouds. These are neat. And by the way, yes, it's April Fool's Day, and this is no April Fool. I know that Isabella... I think I uh, was saying, this is an April Fool's, is it? You know, like, there's going to be a stream. Uh, no, Isabella, it's not April Fool's. There we go. Look at that. Now, that is uh, color-corrected properly. Check that out. Wow. And, Daryl, what is it that's that you don't notice in here right now? Uh, I don't know what I don't know. What, okay, what you do, but you don't... Satellite? Yeah, satellites. We Can actually explain. don't have satellites. We don't have satellites right now coming through. We just oh, happen yeah. to get lucky. Okay. Of course, that's at 40%. I should probably zoom out to see if I've been lying to everybody. And maybe there are satellites out here. Let's find out. Let's go out to auto. Well, I guess I wasn't lying. I don't see any satellites. We had one earlier, but it, it its trail got destroyed by the best rest of the data. Okay, so now let's do this. Let's let's do another one of these stretches. Nice. Now we've stacked twelve images. You can see right here, twelve stacked right there. None have been ignored. And it's for a total of 8 minutes and 0 seconds right now. So we've done an 8 minute exposure of the Orion Nebula. And you don't even know it. Hey, Genghis. Yep. <clears throat> so what we'll do... Um, I'm going to go to... Um, I'll let it go to 13. And then I'm going to uh, save this. And then we'll come out. And we will... Uh, We'll go back into the core of the nebula, and I'll show you something there, which you may have seen before. Okay, so we're going to pause it now. I'm going to hit save, and then right up there across the top, you can see a green bar that shows that it was saved, and it says a .fits file, as I've told you before, <clears throat> fits files in astronomical format. Uh, you can get a free viewer to look at it, or... You can just wait and go grab the photo that I'm about to save out there. Save exactly as you see it right here on the screen. All right, And that's going to be a PNG file that you can just double click on and your computer will automatically open it. And again, this will be up on our free server for you to take images from. So it'll be up there in just a few minutes. Um, gosh, what a beautiful nebula. Just beautiful. And the, the song, is the music is perfect for it. You know, we should just do one of these. No, just like, mm. yeah. Look at that. Wow, that's really pretty. Wow. Um, Isabella asked a minute ago, uh, didn't Messier see the running man? And I looked it up. Uh, 
not surprisingly, uh, uh, the Running Man, also known as NGC 1977, was discovered by William Herschel, who discovered an awful lot of those things. Uh, that's a good question, and I would wonder if Messier didn't see some of that, or maybe his contemporaries did. Um, maybe. Messier only had a four-inch telescope, though, which would exactly yeah. have given him a really brilliant view of the whole neighborhood like uh, this is. Or I know Herschel used a much larger telescope also. Yeah. Okay, down to a one-second shot here. Um, and I'm going to try... I'm going to reduce our gain down to just a tiny amount. And I'll tell you why. I want to show you what's going on in the nebula. I want to show you what's powering this nebula. But you got to understand, it's not just these four stars. The trapezium cluster, which is this, these four stars that I'm zooming in on now, okay? These four stars are not the only ones that are powering this, this nebula. There's a whole bunch of stars here that you can't see and that we can't see. But they're there, and they actually are causing a lot of this nebula to glow. It's not just the trapezium, but they are definitely... The, the core uh, actors that cause this nebula to glow, for sure. The trapezium cluster is really quite extensive. Sean Farva is here. Hey, how you doing? Farva, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, thank you. Just dropped in to see what condition my condition was in. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Renee, in this case, uh, the red and the blue aren't signs of uh, cosmic redshift or cosmic blue shift. Uh, it's just uh, the red means uh, hi uh, fluorescing hydrogen <clears throat> gas, and uh, the blue green means it's uh, fluorescing oxygen. As he says, that's correct. And uh, the uh, it's sort of universal that certain gases will glow a certain color, uh, especially when their atoms are scattered farther apart and they ionize. It has to do with how much time it takes for the electron to come back into the atom. Uh, as you can imagine, in a very, very dense gas, uh, when an electron is knocked off the atom, it's almost immediately kicked back in. Uh, but when it's out in the nebula, it actually takes a little bit more time before it comes back in. Multiply that by trillions of atoms, and you get an overall glow that actually becomes evident. Because what's happening with the Orion Nebula is that when the hydrogen atom, which has one electron, it, that electron is popped off by ultraviolet energy. Well, that sits out there for a bit, bumps into a few things, but then it comes back into the atom. It doesn't always go to the same position where it makes a red light. Okay, But when they come back into the atom, they lose energy, which means they give off some light. That light is not always red it's other colors too but it's predominantly this red because that's the amount of energy that's characteristically lost by an electron over that amount of time uh, and so when it pops back into the uh, atom it's generally a red color um, so that's that's what we see in the in outer space all right so uh, that's how the Orion Nebula works. It's powered by these hot young stars in its center like this. All right. So let's uh, go back to our... You let's might go back say to this. Too, uh, when we see red of hydrogen and oxygen, things on this sort of scale, you might call it on a stellar scale. Uh, when we see... A cosmic redshift or blue shift, well, it's cosmic. It's uh, it's cosmological. It, it's on a much greater scale, like uh, galaxy galaxy. Ga galaxy cluster scales. Yep. <clears throat> and when you think about what redshift actually is, I mean, you, you know what it is, but you just don't know you know what it is. Um, when you hear it with sound... The sound waves are compressed as they're moving towards you from a vehicle coming at you. So the sound is higher pitched. When they're more compressed, higher frequency. Okay. As they leave, 
they go down in frequency. So that's like why you hear when a train goes by your pew, you know, or pew, you know. So that sound shift is called the Doppler effect. Well, in light, we see a change not in sound because there is no sound in space, but we see a change in the color of the light. And the light coming toward us is shifted toward the blue for very fast moving objects. Okay, and again, as Daryl said, we're talking at stellar and cosmic scales. We're not talking, and even galactic scales, we're not talking about individual stars, although we do see that and we actually use that to calculate how fast a star might be rotating around another companion. We, it's, it's called radial velocity, and we use that to detect how fast a star pair is spinning around each other. And that's what we use. We use the blue shift of the star coming at us for a moment, and then the red shift as it goes away. Uh, so it's at stellar scales and galactic scales uh, for different reasons, right? We, for rotating stars or for galaxies, whole galaxies moving away from us or coming toward us. Yeah. It's, it, uh, it, it works on all those scales. Uh, we can study the dark absorption lines and spectral lines of different elements, though. And if they have been red shifted or blue shifted, well, uh, scientists have a pretty good handle on what lines are which and where in the spectrum. And they can yeah. easily detect if those lines have been shifted toward the red or toward the blue end. And the reason that they can is because we know where they're supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Hydrogen alpha is at a specific frequency in the spectrum. You can't miss it. And if it's shifted toward the right side, toward the red, then we know that it's red shifted. If it's shifted toward the blue, it means it's blue shifted. Now, we did this. You know, I did this when I was getting my astronomy degree. We spent time figuring out um, what are called proper motions of the stars. And we figured out the vector in space, the motion, the three-dimensional motion the star took through space based on their spectrum alone. And then knowing that the known value of the lines, we could calculate how much it was coming this way. Okay, and basically a vector is an X direction and a Y direction resulting in this final direction. Okay, and that's in 3D, so it could be any direction. So we had to figure that out. And that was something that was really kind of fun. Um, and so like you had to figure out the proper motion of a certain star based on these parameters in its spectrum. And, and its location and overall motion over say 10 years. And uh, we do that. that. That's what real actual astronomers really do. They actually test and, and, and look for these stars and they detect where they are one year to the next, two years, every 10 years. And then they can calculate the motion of the stars through the galaxy. It's really quite impressive. You know, this is how they figured out the, uh, oh, an example of, it's called the Ursa Major Moving Group. Uh, That's right. They may have shot holes in some of this. I forget exactly what it was now. Uh, whether or not the sun was a member, maybe. But uh, yes. yeah, they have studied the proper <clears throat> motions of uh, stars in our area. And uh, uh, if I remember right, it's all the stars except for the outermost star at the tip of the handle of the Big Dipper and the top star in the bowl of the Big Dipper, uh, Dube, the front top star in the, in the bowl. Uh, are not members, but all the other stars are. And they're moving yeah. together in the same general direction through space. And that's why it's called the Ursa Major Moving Cluster. Um, but I will say this, uh, at one point, we were uh, thought to be part of that moving cluster. For one reason, the stars are close to us. Um, and for another, um, it, it seemed initially like we were moving in the same direction. Well, it turns out that we aren't. And so we're not part of Ursa Major at all, actually. Yeah, that's what I was thinking you know? of. Yeah, no, that's true. You're absolutely right. And so that said, um, the hunt was on to find where we come from. And um, the other thing, too, is when you look at the types of stars that are in Ursa Major, that moving cluster... They would all have to be like us, right? They would have to be made in the same composition as we are. Why? Because we formed from a solar nebula, a stellar nebula, right? The sun was formed in it. And that sun has a certain number of elements in its atmosphere, okay? Um, and those elements will be present in other stars formed in that same place. In fact, exactly the same composition. 
And so none of the stars in the Ursa Major moving group are of our composition. Yeah. That said, we're not part of it. Even if we were moving exactly in the same direction, we didn't come from there. And we're not. So the hunt was on for our sibling. And so far we found one other star <clears throat> that is truly our sibling. It's a star very much like the sun made of the same exact chemical composition as our sun. The chances are 1 in 10 to 20 billion that that would even be true. And so we found a sibling. I can't show it to you because it's in the southern hemisphere. Now, it just happens that that's where it is. But we were born in that same spot and then migrated away from each other. Are there more? Undoubtedly, there are. Undoubtedly. Hello, satellite. Hello. Hello, Starling. And as, and as you said, uh, when we look at other star clusters up in the sky, uh, open clusters, or I guess globulars for that matter, uh, they all tend to be of similar ages and similar types. Yes. Hi, yep. Bonnie. Oh, on a hot of 77. Bonnie is here. Hello. Good to see you. <clears throat> okay. Um... As you can see, this is the Horsehead Nebula, and I now have a guide star, and we're going to take, let's go for a one-minute shot. Let's just see if the settings are good. I just have to see. This is Sigma Orionis down here. It's a multiple star. Many stars are more than one star. Daryl said this to you. I've told you this. Um, most stars are double stars, and some are triple stars, like the Alpha Centauri uh, group. You have an A and B component, which are going around each other. Then far outside of them, you've got another one going around both of them. And that's 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 the C star, you know, uh, uh, Proxima, which is a small red dwarf. So, but most stars are doubles and some are triples. But in this particular case, uh, with Sigma Orionis, it appears that we might actually have uh, even more. Uh, star components in the uh, Sigma Rhinus family. Yeah, there may be six six or more stars there. Yeah. Well, let's get this exposure for a minute and see how our guiding is looking. And Sigma is what's doing much of the illumination of the uh, the big Very red nice. wall of nice. dust, the dust cloud. Yep. We'll look at it in a second. Okay, here we go. Now we'll get this done right and get rid of this. And then, boom. Ah, beautiful. Here we go. All right, so. So, here's this beautiful uh, right, uh, Horsehead Nebula, also known as Barnard 33, named after E.E. Uh, e. Barnard, who it was uh, made a catalog of Dark Nebula. This, of course, is what's called a Dark Nebula. You can see it because it's being silhouetted against this wall of red, which Daryl just told you about. This star here and some of the other stars are responsible for causing this hydrogen gas to glow and thus silhouette the horse head. Otherwise, we might never have seen it, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Up north here, we have the Flame Nebula. Uh, which is made to glow by Alnatok here. This is the leftmost star in Orion's belt. There's two more stars up that away. Okay, we have Alnatok, Alnalam in the middle, and then Mintaka further on out. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. It's just a beautiful sight. Uh, and we'll stack only about five of these. We've captured this a lot. I want to take a look at some other objects tonight that are coming up while we have our chance. If you look at the telescope, you can see it's, it's, it's way over to the west. And we got plenty of time, but it, it is lower in the sky a little bit. Yep. Now, let me uh, just... Let me just enhance this just a little bit. Where'd it go? Why is that doing that? Give it another month, and uh, mm. Orion's going to be close to the horizon or to 8 or 8.30. Oh, yeah. I believe that for sure. Yep. Okay. This should be able to just do 
am I getting into the same weird thing again? All right, let me do this. All right, we'll do auto hide. All right. So, um, this, let me just, uh, let me just do this. Let me pull this black level in just a little bit. Got a satellite right there. A little too much. Satellite right there. No. Wow. Okay. A little color correction here. Okay, not much difference yet. Okay, let's just do this one more time. See where it puts the level. You can move a little more out. Alright, that's pretty cool. Well, let's do... Let's take this mid-level and move it in just a little bit to kind of push out some details that might be hiding in the background there and then darken up our view just a tad that might be too much yeah that's too much well makes for a nice picture it does that, that's nice right that's there that's a little yeah i gotta just come back a little bit that's that's good all right, uh, let's see. Yeah, Isabella, uh, it may depend somewhat on how far east or west you are in your given time zone, but uh, here uh, uh, in Colorado where I live, uh, Orion is, Rigel is about to touch the western horizon at 10.30 in the evening now, so it is going away. Wow. I'm using a new version of this program and it actually does some interesting things. So that's pretty cool. That's beautiful. This is a beautiful little, uh, you know, you can imagine this is another horse head to some other extraterrestrial civilization looking at it maybe from slightly other angle looking that way at it. it might be sticking out of this cloud now you might think that this is just sort of like an edge it goes all the way this edge goes all the way through this is a, a cloud here that goes all the way through you're just seeing the edge of this cloud right here so I that's always, what's going on yeah. here i always imagine uh their brightest red line <clears throat> is sort of like a wall that is facing more toward uh sigma and then uh, what's left of that bright edge is uh, where the cloud is coming around toward us, more like it's billowing toward us. Yeah, this here. This yeah. is like coming toward us right here. Maybe this is actually partially sticking out in a direction, coming at us a little bit. Maybe like, like maybe like this or something, you know, or like that, you know, coming mm -hmm. at us a little bit. And we can't tell because it looks flat to us. But again, this object here is. Uh, well, got to be a, a more than a light year or two across in, in height, I think. I have to figure that out. But that's beautiful. Indeed it is. Yep. And it's not surprising, really, that E.E. E. Barnard uh, discovered it. Uh, Barnard was one of the pioneers of astrophotography back in the late 1800s, the 1870s or 1880s, I think. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, he started taking pictures of the night sky, and he started finding dark clouds. And that's where his catalog came from, dark mm -hmm. objects. Thank you, Vera. Okay, how many we got stacked? Seven? All right, we'll go to eight and then we'll stop. This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, select the object. So maybe we'll get an extra one out of this. Barnard 33 is the name of the Horsehead Nebula and it's a DN or a Dark Nebula. So there we go. Okay, so we have eight. And we're going to pause right now. And then we'll save. And you'll see the green bar across the top. 
right? And then I'll save the image exactly as you see it here. There it is. And then we'll clear this. It's almost like, why clear it? It's a piece of art. Oh, you know, but it's okay. It's okay. And now let's go back to doing one second exposure. And then hyper our view, give us a nice hybrid view. All right. There we go. And now we'll come back and go into our planetarium. Um, there's one I saw, which I didn't, I don't think we ever looked at. Maybe we did, but it goes by a different name. Uh, it was called the Angel Nebula. Right there. Hmm. See it? And I have not seen that. At least I don't think we looked at it, but we're going to go there now. All right. So here we go. We're moving over. And what we're going to do is we're going into, I think, Monoceros now. And we're probably going to drop in on one of the stars in Orion here. This might be safe. I'm not sure. I can't tell. Yeah, it is. Okay, cool. So that's Scythe. That's the lower left star in Orion. You have Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, all right, Rigel, and Safe. And you have Alnataka on the Mintaka in the middle. And that's centered up now. And then from there, you can see where the telescope is pointing. It's going to move a little bit more to that side. There it goes. And it's going to come up to this little reflection nebula. That's called the Angel Nebula. I've never seen this before, so let's... That's right there, I think. I'm going to have to take a... a expo it might be there. I'm going to take a longer exposure here just to see what we've got. We'll let it... Oh, it's right there. There, it's clearly right there. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to say a little... Looks like a fuzzy star in this field. It does. Uh, yeah. Luxury. I'm going to move it into the center. Just to do that. And then we'll wait our obligatory 11 seconds in order to get our guide star. Because that's what, how long it takes for the system to register a guide star and get it ready. Um, actually, before I do that, I'm going to zoom into 100%. Make sure that our temperature compensation for the focus is still accurate and it looks it looks very nice okay so now we can pop out <clears throat> go back to our full frame view okay <clears throat> and now we'll take and we're gonna go 45 seconds and off we go 45 seconds and I'm gonna hit this button to undo our hyper view because that just makes it look really really too bright and then we'll grab the stack and there we go I don't see your camera's temperature settings anymore yeah they're right there oh well oh, uh, you know you know where they are that's because they're actually down below here see oh okay Very Th good. thermal controls I just have them off the screen because they're not needed that's fine <clears throat> I get all that information now on the screen. Mm. Okay. Let's go see what we got. Okay, so first things first, we're going to process. Okay, that's pretty. A little bit green, let's get rid of that. There we go. I mean, we've got a number of stars here that are really beautifully colored here. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Faint nebulosity around them. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Jenny Maybe we have here. Those. That's funny. I was just thinking of you, Jenny. 
And she says, Jenny wants to just say hi. It's such a beautiful night. Well, thank you, Jenny. It's so nice to see you. Keith isn't here. It's Daryl. I talked to Keith earlier tonight. It's so nice to see you. It's so cool. And Mike's telescopes are always clouded out here in Florida. Uh, show them NGC 2903. It's high in, in uh, just east of the meridian. Okay. That's a request. NGC 2903. We'll let this percolate for a couple minutes. Um, well, actually, let me just pull it full screen here. Okay. And then uh, just get it a little bit larger. All right, so people can watch that. All right. Oh, satellites. <laughs> and then while it's doing that, let's do that search for NGC 2903. It's in Leo. Yeah, all right. Yeah, there it is. Spiral Galaxy. <clears throat> yep. An SAB, so it's probably going to be rather tight. Hey, Cindy Murphy. Nice to see you. All right, we'll check out NGC 2903 in just a couple seconds. Satellites sure are out tonight. Mm, I know. Look at this. Look at this beautiful, beautiful. Uh, you can see this amazing. Uh, this amazing. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> oh wow! Looks like it's tumbling too. It, yeah, look at that. It's, like, it's tumbling right there. A little bright spot there indicates that it's something coming through and then tumbling slowly, or ri rapidly actually. Uh, All right. When you were pointing out that faint nebulosity there, left to center, uh, yep. a while ago, I see the dark. I see dark spider webbing in that. Well, right here, you can see there's this beautiful filament here. There's another satellite here that went through. Um, but let me uh, let me see if I can pull out some more detail. Okay, going to do this. I'm going to just squeeze this some more. And now I'm going to pull this back over. And see what we can pull out. Yeah, it's there. Do you see it? Uh, right here? Yeah. Several ones. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. That's actually there. Yeah. So that's this beautiful uh, reflection nebula. Okay, but that's this is reflection nebula. This stuff here. Okay, this red is not. This red is emission nebula mixed in, and there's dark nebula in here as well. <clears throat> so what was this that I looked at now? Oh, the Angel Nebula, right. It's not actually in here, so I'm going to label it as that. All right. Okay. <clears throat> we'll do eight. And then pause it and move on. If somebody wants to do some more processing on this, that's cool. All right, there's eight. I will pause it. And I will save it. And it'll show up as Angel Nebula. And then we're going to save it exactly as seen. That's the ping file right there. 
Alright. Alright, so now we're gonna go to this other object that Mike's telescope suggested. Yeah, Mike, I saw the uh, satellite subtraction button, um, but um, for faint trails like this, uh, obviously the trails last for one frame, um, maybe two, okay? But they only ever cross one piece of space and then subsequent photos, they're taking the dark of space and overlaying it on the satellite trail the dark of space overlaying it okay and just does that time after time so if you're stacking uh, within just a few image stack uh, frames that satellite trail will go away we've seen that time and time again see this satellite trail just got a lot dimmer see that it was a lot brighter and now we can barely see it one or two more stacks it'll be gone all right so I'll, I'll pause this now. And we've got... Uh, I gotta get rid of that. So we're gonna clear this. We already, we already saved this. Okay. And now we'll kill this stack. Come back. Do this guy for one second. Yes, I can do the quick picks, but it's okay. I'm, I like doing it this way, actually. David Byrne is here. Hey, David Burney. All right. And let's pop this up a little bit higher. And now let's go check out NGC 2903 by request from Mike's Telescope. Uh, it's actually, let me just see how high it is. Okay, that's pretty high up there, so we should be good. There we go. We'll come over here. You're going to see the whole screen shifting here now. Zoom. So I want to see my telescope again, so let's prove that. There we go. What do you think, Daryl? You think it's going to use uh, Regulus? I would. Let's find out. Let's see if it's going to Regulus. Right there, high precision swing. Where's it going to? Oh, Rasalacid. Alright, Okay. I know, right? And that's uh, this uh, right there. Here it says Aljanubi. Yeah. Is that the other name? Is that another name for Rasalacid? You got me. Yeah, I would. I, don't know. I would assume so. Well, there's the galaxy anyway. It's beautiful. All right, we'll center that up, and we'll take a nice photograph of that. Bonnie liked your answer. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Bonnie. This is actually a nice little spiral galaxy. Uh, yeah. We'll see how, how it does with our image scale. Yeah. Let's go to 100% on the sensor just to see what we got. Yeah, I can see dark objects in there already. That's pretty good. All right, let's see. It is about 12 by 5 uh, arc minutes. Yeah, a 12 being this direction here. Okay, so now let's go and let's do a 50 second exposure. No, actually we don't need to. This is bright. This will be just a 40 second exposure. Right? And we'll stack it. So we'll get rid of that, go into our live stack, and let's play. Yeah. 
And obviously, you know, we don't we don't need to uh, use our brightness over here. This is the only one we need. Then we gotta just adjust it once it comes in. <clears throat> Okay, so this object that we're doing right now is called NGC 2903. Okay, it says right there, it's an active galaxy. And there it is. That's actually really pretty just like this without processing, but we'll process it. Do a little processing here, kind of get some of the wisps on there. Here we go. Notice the noise, that noise goes away. Uh, as with the more we stack because that noise is averaged out over time so it's NGC 2903 it's an active galaxy let's go and zoom in on it let's go to 75 percent nice little spiral uh bard spiral it looks like but it's it's uh might be yeah Huh, let's go see. Uh, okay, so Active Galaxy SAB. Huh. Yeah, but it's it's an active galaxy. It's got a lot of things going on inside there, so not really sure. Okay, let's just do this. Herschel found this one too. Did he? Yep. William wow. Herschel, that is. Yes. There were actually that two or three pretty. Herschels, weren't there? What William Herschel, his son, and his uh, Caroline Herschel, her. Was she his sister? I don't know Caroline Herschel. Uh, I forget. I'd have to look that up. Okay. Well, this is actually a really pretty object. Mike's Telescope, thank you for the suggestion. It looks great. And I'm going to just bring our black level in just a, a little bit a little bit more it's sensitive because it's a very 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 uh, close to the mid-range let's just drop this down soften it up a little bit I don't like having images that are too harsh yeah, see? That's beautiful. Now, the other thing that I will do is I'm going to put on and turn on the unsharp mask. And that will be helpful as well. So watch it get sharper now. Pretty good. Oh, yeah, look at that. Look at that. You can even see a hydrogen 2 region right there. Oh, yeah. The galaxy. A large one. There's a number of them, actually. Dark lanes. Beautiful. Very nice. Yeah. Wow. I like it. Pretty galaxy. Yeah. The uh, spiral arm to the upper left looks faintly distorted. This one? Yeah. Hmm. And what might have done that? I don't know. I see a little fuzzball over to the left of the galaxy. Might be a satellite this or right something. Here. Yeah, I don't think that would have disturbed the arm like that, though. Uh, it, it, it could have. Dwarf galaxies can do a number on things. Yeah. And Michael Clagus says, How about one of boats? M81 and M82. Well, they are higher in the sky now, so that's cool. 
Really, really pretty. This is a good one. Okay, we're gonna call this uh, NGC 2903, because that's what it is. Isabella, an active galaxy is, uh, oh, what is it? It's got an active supermassive black hole in it. At the very least, it might have a black hole like that, but they, most of them have supermassive black holes. Yeah. But um, active galaxies are also, uh, sometimes they're radio galaxies. They give off radio jets. Um, they also have other jets of radiation they can shoot out. Um, so active galaxies have a number of different qualities. Um, I have to look this one up to see what this one does. Some um, are masers. Uh, and some are, um, uh, they, they generate a, a specific type of radiation that's on a tight beam, sometimes a broad beam, uh, usually out the top and bottom of the galaxy. And it has to do with some interaction they had at one point, possibly, or because of the supermassive black hole in the center. But they all have a, a supermassive black hole in the center, typically, which is I, probably, I think, what we're going to find is that galaxies form because of these supermassive black holes, which are probably more prevalent than people realize in the universe. That's my guess. Uh, this is my thought. It is a barred spiral. Okay. Modern, tightly wound spiral arms. Yep. Uh, blah, blah. Well, uh, turns out William Herschel discovered it, but he didn't, he mistook it as a double nebula. Uh, third L of Ross resolved it into spiral. Okay. Yeah. We can definitely see. Now here's, this is a good example of a Bart spiral, guys. If you take a look, this is the nucleus. Normally, the spiral arms come right off the nucleus. But if you notice, there's this long thing here. And the spiral arm seems to start here and go out this way. Okay, and this one comes off and starts out and goes this way. It's yet, it, this is the bar through the nucleus. It's an elongated nucleus, and off of that is the spiral arms. So this is what we call a barred spiral. It's a classic barred spiral. Yeah, Mike's telescope, I can't uh, look 25 degrees uh, above the horizon because the edge of the building, if you look at the building there, okay, this is this is where we're looking right now obviously east is this wall and toward the east now i did that because phoenix arizona 2500 miles from here is that way and although you can't see the light from phoenix 65 miles away you can actually see it with the cameras so i put the telescope off center so that we have a better northern western and southern exposures to look at and the east is um, sacrificed so that we can actually see things as they start to approach the meridian, which is the line, folks, uh, along the south, uh, from north to south. It's the line through north to south. So, uh, so that said, uh, what we're doing now is just uh, forcing ourselves to look at objects when they're actually better for our telescope to see them. And we rush a few things, you know, there's, when, when, trust me, when the Orion Nebula was coming up, I rushed it to see it. But now it's already past the meridian, past that center point from north to south. And it's going to be gone soon. And then the spring galaxy season comes up and we see things like this. Look at that. I do this because I have two monitors. That's the observatory feed. This is the broadcast feed. So I'm looking at both monitors. I have two eyes. I can just look both, you know, both directions. <laughs> Vera asks, Mark, do you think that black holes from galaxies uh, form galaxies or the opposite? Well, um, that's interesting you say that. Um, I'd say yes. I'd, I'd say that, uh, well, yes, meaning you, you haven't given a definitive answer. Um, well, both. Supermassive, yeah, supermassive black holes in the center of a galaxy uh, are definitely seen in the galaxy. And so they look. we look at those and say, oh, are these, you know, SMBHs, the supermassive black holes in the middle of these galaxies, are these the things that attracted everything else to the galaxy? 
I would think that maybe that could be true, but I also think that most likely, because the nucleus of a galaxy is a very complex and dense location where there's lots of stars, it only takes a few stars to start uh, going supernovae and leaving behind black holes for them to start eating other stars and growing. So it's possible that over billions of years, a supermassive black hole could form in a galaxy. So it, it's, it, you know, I'm not trying to say both because I don't really know if both is the actual answer. But I do think that a supermassive black hole uh, could certainly form in a galaxy. But you also have to ask, well, it's like a chicken or the egg. What came first? Yeah. The SMBH or the galaxy? See? Oh, and that's I something could... that I don't think anyone really knows, to be honest. Uh, it might be conjecture, you know. Uh, I could imagine uh, very early black holes maybe formed during the Big Bang. Uh, could have been the seeds that the first galaxies formed around. It's, that's that's true. Just a thought. That's true. No, it's not a bad thought. I'm going to turn on this bilateral filter, and it's going to make it look a lot less noisy like that. Okay. Um... If I change the radius on the bilateral filter, it'll make it a little bit sharper, but take away some of the noise. Turn it off, and you'll see what happens. Okay, you'll see that you, you get a little sharper lines here, but the galaxy looks sharper. <clears throat> Judy McClelland is here. Hello, Judy. Nice to see you. Really nice to see you. Oh, darn it. My tea is gone. Will you excuse me a moment, please? Sure. Okay. So as we let this stack go, you can see much more detail coming through. We're at the native size of, this, of the uh, sensor right now at 100%. So this is uh, the maximum size. If we go back down to uh, what the telescope sees as a whole, then you'll see just how much more there is outside this field of view, okay? So here it is, and there it is, see that? Um, and let's go back to here and let's do a another adjustment here okay and the color correction see if that does anything it does a little bit okay so now if we go back to um let's say 100 percent you can see how the telescope uh is really quite good at supporting these kinds of uh magnifications it's really nice look at that that's really pretty all right and we're at 20 frames stacked here okay so we have 20 stacked we're gonna pause it right here and and you see 2903 a galaxy we're gonna save this here that's very nice. Fitz file is saved. What's that? That's very nice. Yeah, it is pretty, huh? Okay, save exactly as seen. And now we'll clear it. And it will be up there on our server for you to grab. All right. Okay, so now let's go out and bring back our... <clears throat> hyper view where we can actually see um let's do it this way yep yeah. and we can actually see uh, the stars and even the galaxies go back out of 100 percent and come back down to the auto mode where we actually have our nice filled screen there there we go all right so the question now is where do you want to go next and I think we had um, another request out there, right? Did we have another request? 
I don't remember. I, think I we know did. we took a pretty good jump to the east. Uh, oh, I know Montes we were asked to go Mont to. Yeah. Montes Sorry. To Leo. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're I did want to look at part of the sky now, and it's that time of year. Uh, it is. It's not that bad. It's pretty high up there, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, Al Danubi, uh that's the uh, top of the sickle, or the top yep. front of the sickle. You might and say that's the lion's eyebrow. Uh, there's Regulus. Uh, there's Algeba, there's Regulus. Yeah, so we come down here, and let's see, uh, we got the M105, M95, we got the Leo triplet, we've got all kinds over there. Um... What is a really good-looking galaxy right here? Well, obviously, M95 and M96 look great Yeah. Uh, here. So we... we uh, they're more impressive than, than M105. Yeah, and then, we noticed then you that got before. the triplet over there with uh, 65 the and 66 galaxy. and the hamburger galaxy. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's do M95 and M96 for now. And then we'll come back to that. What do you think? Sure. And the whole sky is opening up above you now. Uh, got mm. tons of galaxies in uh, Coma Berenices, 4565, the, uh, the needle galaxy. Yeah, we want to see that. Let's look at it. Yep. Hmm. That's almost straight up. That's pretty good. Definitely galaxy season. Okay. And now you see the telescope come down to here. Alrighty. And I can already see M90... Six right there, I think. And let's move down. I think that's M96 here, and M95 will be to its right. Okay, so yep. we'll move over. There'll be more galaxies up top as well. We are in. The galaxy region now. It's galaxy season. You know, I'm going to tell you, uh, I look at these and think, you know, we could very well, and I've said this before thousands of times, we could be looking at other civilizations and not even know it. You know, I'm going to just move this down a little bit so we can bring these galaxies down into the field of view at least. Yeah. Because there's several more I forgot more to mention, there. when we were looking at NGC 2903, that uh, it's considered a member of the Virgo supercluster. I guess that shouldn't be surprising. Yeah. Which, of course, M87, the galaxy that sports that beautiful supermassive black hole, yeah. is also one such member. Yeah, as Michael Clagus says, the Hubble Deep Field... <laughs> all right so we'll wait now the obligatory time and then we'll these galaxies are pretty bright uh this brightness you see in the sky that's not the result of like light pollution it's actually the result of the sensor being set up pretty high and right now for us we're actually looking in a region that's pretty dark in the sky but uh, i have it set up pretty high yeah, Michael, just wait a moment. You got, let's see, one, two, three, uh, four, five, and then uh, there's another another one or two in this area, too. Well, you know what? Let's just do the exposure and see. Well, heck, this was a one-second exposure, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, right now, yeah. So let's do this, let's uh, say a, let's do uh, a 30-second exposure. All right. And let's do that. 
Oops, wait a minute. Where'd you go? Okay, let's do this again. 30 second exposure. Okay, and we'll stack. I wonder what we'll see. I wonder what we'll see. <laughs> you know, this reminds me, uh, you asked recently about the antennae galaxies. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're in uh, Corvus, the crow down below yeah. Virgo. Uh, yeah, I don't think we can see him yet. Yeah, it might be a little early for Arizona. And yeah. there are five minutes across arc minutes, so. Yeah. You'd probably see something. Okay. Well, I bet. Okay, let's just do a color correction, which we don't really need. And let's do this correction. Hey, we only have one in here now, so we're just going to do this for now just so we can see uh, what we have. I think it's kind of cool. Look at that. Beautiful. And as they stack, these, this detail will become even more prevalent. All right, so now let's count the galaxies. We have one, two, three, four, five. And I thought there was another one up here somewhere that I'm missing. You stack more exposures, more may become visible. Yeah, yeah. I remember there was something over here that was really faint. But that's all right. Uh, let's now, let me do this. Let me grab my, let's pull the stack up. And uh, now, is that M105 to the upper left of uh, 95 I think or we talked about that. I think we talked about that. And I don't, I don't remember if that's true. I don't remember if that's true. Let's go look. You're talking about this guy. Yeah. Okay, well, let's first of all, let's, let's line up on this. Yes. M105. So you want M105. All right. So I moved them like this. So no, I didn't. This way. And so what did we pull in? Yeah, M105 and the other one. There's those other two. Yep. 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 And apparently... Okay, so there's the one I thought we would see. It's it's just off off the screen here. It's this little guy right there. See it? That's what I thought we were looking... We're going to see here. <clears throat> wow, really pretty... Okay. Yeah, it's just off the view. We're just not quite in the view here. Really nice. 95 and 96 are also barred spirals, are they not? Both of them? Uh, this one, I think, is a barred spiral. I don't know about uh, 90s. This is 95 here. I don't know about 95. Maybe it is. I think you might be right. I think we discovered that last time, didn't we? We were talking about it? I think we did. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go to 100% and drop down to look at this. Yeah. I guess that's correct. You can see the bar. Mm. And let's uh let's bring in a little bit of darkness in the background there to help with the contrast. There we go. That's nice. That's really nice. 
Okay, and then we come over here. And then this guy, you can clearly see the bar. This is what I was talking about, guys. You see this bar through here? No spiral arms are coming off the nucleus. They, they come off the bar. So the bar comes out here, and then the spiral arm goes off that. Spiral arm goes off that other bar. And that's what causes this. That's... That's a what's called a barred spiral, B-A-R-R-E-D spiral. Okay, so now let's back out a little. Thank you, Isabella, for putting that up for us. Isabella is very good at doing that. She also does all, all of our table of contents for each stream, too, by the way, guys. So show her some love, because she does that just because. She's the best. Yep. Without doubt. Let me go back into my stacking here for a minute and I'm going to uh going to come into enhancements and I'm gonna try and put that bilateral filter in to kick out the noise again. Okay, let me just knock down, go sub pixel on this. <clears throat> that looks nice. Uh -huh. Isabella says, I just love galaxies. You know what? Yeah, and what's interesting is when you see these stars here, guys, these are all stars up here in our galaxy, and we're seeing something way out here way beyond millions and millions of light years away from those stars All right and keep in mind you're looking at those galaxies as they were millions of years ago okay and how many millions well let's go this is measure 96 this is measure 95 if we look at measure 96 okay measure 96 here All right this galaxy let me just grab it Right. Measure 96 is actually uh, literally 31 million light years away. So, uh, you know, 30, 30 million years after the dinosaurs died, the light from Measure 96 started on its way here that you're seeing tonight right there. Okay, which is really kind of cool. Measure 95, probably about the same distance. Um, it's, uh, no, uh, it's 32 million light years away. Okay, so they're neighbors, basically, in space, effectively. But that's pretty interesting, isn't it? I Again, think of it as a think of it as a time machine, yeah? Um, when they are going out to galactic scales like this, why do they continue yeah. to use parsecs? Well, a parsec is, you know, 3.26 light years. Yeah. You know, and they use kiloparsecs generally to to talk about distances to galaxies and so forth. You know, thousands of parsecs, right? One kiloparsec is a thousand parsecs, right? Which is, of course, 3.26 light years per parsec, right? So if you multiply that, again, you're, you're, you're actually looking at, you know, 3,260 light year, uh, you know, per parsec kind of a thing. Or per kiloparsec, right? Yeah. <clears throat> So a thousand parsecs actually. So it's actually, you know, quite a. Well, I just uh, always thought, you know, that I mean, parsecs were involved in. In uh, I'm having a brain lock here. Uh, parallax seconds. Thank you. That's yes, what parallax. Uh, why they would continue out to galactic scales? May I answer Isabella's well, question? Sure. Isabella, they weren't sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I mentioned the Earl of Ross earlier. Uh, uh, he uh, looked. He looked at a lot of spiral galaxies. Uh, if I'm thinking of the same guy, uh, was that the guy that had the big, huge telescope? Uh, for back in the day. Well, Herschel had, had that big telescope. Uh, well, it was, uh, I'd have to go look him up again. Uh, 
uh, they started seeing nebulas. They called them spiral nebulas back in the day. And uh, they used to think they were just spiral nebulas. Uh, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, figured out that uh, galaxies were indeed discrete so-called island universes, they used to say back in the day. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a long story, but he discovered Cepheid variables in our galaxy, and then he started finding Cepheid variables in other galaxies, and this gets in what's nowadays it's called the cosmic Cosmological distance ladder. Distance ladder. Yep. Uh, and if you found a Cepheid variable of a certain time period in our galaxy, and you found a Cepheid variable of a similar time period in another galaxy, you knew b because how much dimmer that distant star was compared to the close one that uh, it must be like millions of light years away and, uh, and their, that was their luminosity is their luminosity is tied to their uh, their period of yes. variability yeah and so that that luminosity relation is the thing that actually gave us the distances to the galaxies and um, yeah. I have a book right in was, front of me is, is about, it was uh, Andromeda wasn't it uh, it's one, well, one of the ones they did it, sure. It's one of the ones that they, they measured, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I have to share with everybody. Okay, I'm going to turn on my uh, background here so you can see for a second. I have this book. Uh, it's from the 1800s. Uh, it's a first edition. It's called uh, The Architecture of the Heavens in a Series of Letters to a Lady. Okay, and in the book, they show spiral nebulae. And uh, the book is falling apart, but I've read the book cover to cover. It's written in flowery language, and it's written in terms that will allow a professor at a university to maintain his tenure. Why? Because in the day, in the days of the 1800s, uh, astronomy was not uh, considered a valid science because it was tied to astrology still at the time. And because of that, for astronomers to get their points across about the heavens, they typically had to write it uh, in some way that would be sort of cryptic. Now, there's no lady in the 1800s that was going to read a book on astronomy. Um, so it wasn't written for women. It was written for men. Okay, keep in mind that this was a man's science way back when. Yet, you know, you have women like Annie Jump Cannon who actually changed the course of our astronomical uh, uh, understanding with her work you know um, and then you had Herschel. women that that's right you know and then Early you had women that, that yeah and you had women who studied spectra of stars and classified stars that's all they did okay and having done a lot of star classifications I can tell you that I was just blown away by how much work is actually involved in trying to figure that out but this is an example of a spiral nebula. Uh, there it is, you can kind of see it now. Uh, it's just a little pen and ink drawing, stippled picture that is all they could understand of these things. And this entire book is entirely wrong. However, it's written in such beautiful flowery language that you almost wish it wasn't untrue. You know? You know, it's a science, uh, it's actually an astronomer, uh, Nichols who is actually trying to explain the universe and his ideas. And nowhere in there uh, that they talk about galaxies as being something far away because they don't even know about our own galaxy per se. They only knew the most rudimentary values about our galaxy and they thought everything was in it. You know, they didn't know that they're looking beyond it in many cases. So that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, one of the issues with historical texts like this is that you know you look at what they believed at the time and you you then understand how it progressed to where it is now because if you think about it what do you think William Herschel would have thought if he saw the results from the Hubble Space Telescope he would have been shaking his head in disbelief uh, and probably would never use his telescope again you know, he'd only want to have access to the Hubble stuff. Oh, sure. You know, 
that's how it works. That's how it works. But as we progress, we learn. And, and someday we'll have pictures of these galaxies that is so far and away beyond of what we have now. You know, that it's just not going to be uh, even worth using our telescope out in the desert. Can you believe that? Yet right now, it's probably one of the finest instruments on the planet for doing what we're doing. Um, and literally, I looked on YouTube. I tried to find other observatories doing what we're doing. And there's there's very few. There's other people doing nighttime shots and all that. But not many of them are doing these finished images for you to just take and have a free server where you can just go get them. No one has that. You know? And the thing is, um, I don't understand why, but it just happened that uh, I just didn't want to take no for an answer. I had to be able to explore the sky and not just for myself. I had to take all of you with me. So it's my fault. Blame me. Okay? It's my fault you're wasting your time right now. <laughs> and David Schmidt is here. Hello, David Schmidt. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah, I'm going to also zoom in on this galaxy up here because okay. uh, this is one of those galaxies that's really blue. And I like it a lot. Look at that. Look at the I'm color on this. Come to the defense of Caroline Herschel. Uh, Caroline Herschel was a brother, was uh, the sister of William Herschel. Uh, mm -hmm. She started her astronomical work in the late, late 1700s. Uh, she worked with her brother. She became an accomplished astronomer on her own. Uh, mm -hmm. She was the first woman to receive a salary as a scientist and the first woman in England to hold a government position of any kind. She wow, was also see? the first woman to publish scientific findings in the transaction of the Royal Society. She was re awarded a gold medal by the Royal Astronomical Society in 1828 and uh, became an honor honorary member of. Uh, she, uh, blah, blah, became a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 1838. Uh, she lived to 98 years of age. Wow. <clears throat> that's fantastic. Well, see, that's the thing, you know. Uh, women were not accepted in science. You know, well, you know how long it took them to just learn to get the right to vote for crying out loud. It's crazy, you know. But this is what happens, you know. And that's what happened. That was our history. Uh, luckily, though, that is behind us forever and ever. It's never going to happen again. Um you know, humans only make mistakes like that once, I think. But anyway, uh, we have done quite a number of these, and we're going to stop stacking these. Uh, we're going to let this last one come in, give us an even 35, and then we will actually... Um, all right, even 35 there. We're going to pause this now, and then we're going to save it. Uh, no, we're not. Darn it all, he's just screwed it up. See, you let me do that, Daryl. Why'd you do that? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, M95, M95, and M96. And that's going to ask me if I want to change the name, and yes, I do. All right, and I'll save it again. I'll correct that when we get out there. It might actually, it might correct itself. Correct I've seen it correct what? itself, so... The naming. Oh. The naming. It'll, it might correct the naming. Okay. All right. Well, this is beautiful. Now we'll clear this guy. All right. And go back to one second exposure. I think, um, was it Mike's telescope or Michael Clagus that actually asked us about another object? I don't mind requests. We're all we can be the all request hour if you guys want to have a request if you know what you're looking for. And everybody else that doesn't will have an enjoyable time looking at it. I think it was NGC eight eight thousand something. It was like eighty. Who said that? I don't remember. I'll find it. Eighty. Uh, no, thirty-four eighty-six. It was Mike's telescope. 
A uh, little dim, no tilt. Yeah, yeah. Leo Minor. Just a suggestion. Well, let's see where it is. I assume your name is Mike. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Our guiding is good. I don't have to worry about the rates. Let's look up. Oh, I, I updated our, our program here uh, to do our Stellarium thing. So now uh, every time we uh, go hunting for something, it'll be giving us a list that we can just click in. It's a little a little change, but it works. 3486. Let's see where this is. Okay, did you see 3486? All right, well, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, we can see it. Let's try it. Off we go. It's not going to move the telescope very much to see it. It's probably going to just go back to Algenib or something like that. Can you back out in Stellarium a bit? I am. I am, yeah. Okay, so we're going to Corona Borealis right now. Let me come out of this for a sec. Okay, well, there was Osma down in the lower right corner. That's okay. uh, Leo's uh, left hip, or his rear hip. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's... All right, so we're here. And now we should go to this. We should be going to 3486 now. And we should see it in here right now. That's it right there. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Uh, now, Mike, what you're doing is you're giving us objects that need a little bit more... Um, you need a little bit more focal length, but that's okay. David Schmidt, that's not circus music. Don't you know what that is? That's Waltz of the Flowers by Tchaikovsky. I'm <laughs> very disappointed, David. I can't hear the music, <laughs> so I have no idea. <laughs> that's funny. All right, this object might be in need of more focal length to see, but we're going to try it anyway. Let's first of all, let's go to 100% just to see what we got. Alright, I, I think I want to do another focusing run. You can actually see it when it, in moments of clarity. You can see some really nice spiral arms in there though. Looks pretty nice. Okay, let's go to 50%. And now let's do a focusing run. Actually, before I do that, though, I want to set it out of focus because it's not exactly right. And I want to bring it out of focus just enough so that I can then move it into focus. Second galaxy over on the left. Here? Or there? Yeah. Okay, let me uh, see what I've got here. Uh, all right I had to remove temperature correction so when I do this now now it'll go out okay so there we go now we're out and now what I can do is go back in and have it do a nice focusing run it was close but it wasn't right perfect so this makes it perfect so now it's selected the stars that are it's going to use it. It's, it's a refocusing run. And now we're going to scan inward. It'll pass that focus. 
as you'll see, the stars are going to get small into tiny dots again, and then uh, it will they will change back to large blobs again. And that's going to be out of focus, in focus, out of focus, and then that center spot is where we're going to come back to. I've noticed that this algorithm is quite accurate. Go ahead, Daryl. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Uh, excuse me a moment, please. You said, yeah, sure. Oofy, yeah, hey, Oofy's here. Hi, Oofy. How you doing? I missed you earlier. I'm sorry. David Schmidt, that's a very nice thing to say. He says, Isabella, I've been following Mark for several years now. I just wanted to thank you for sharing so much of your time and energy to help catalog and save these incredible images. Kudos. That's that's a very nice thing, David. Thank you for saying that. Okay, we're at 10 of 12 steps, and we're going to go to 11. And it's going to take three sam samples of the focus, and then go to... 12 and do three samples of the focus. <laughs> I was in my thrall, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Yuffie, yeah. Okay, so now we have a green bar, so now we have a central focus point, and now we're going to go to best position. You're going to see the thing slide all the way over to the other side and go back to the best focus position. All right, so there it goes, all the way to the other side, back out of focus, and then it comes down, boom. And now we have really sharp focus. Perfect. All right. And now what we do is get rid of this because we're done with the focus segment. All right. Now we can do a, oh, well, first of all, let me center the galaxy a little more. I kind of like the blues. This music you hear is the blues. I like playing it on my electric guitar. I mean, don't know why. I just sit there and go to town. It's just like amazing. I just love that music. Just live with it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, I'm not going to play the guitar. This is a uh, astronomy session. Okay, let's do... A 35 second shot here and that's all we need here all right okay and once again I should have that's 35 milliseconds <laughs> it should be 35 seconds shot there we go all right and now we can go in 35 seconds is underway you can see the status bar right over here it goes across. This is the previous shot. I'm going to clear it. All right. This is the kind of stuff I like to play, this kind of stuff. You make all the faces, you know. Oh, look at that. That's really pretty. Mike, uh, thank you. That was an excellent suggestion. Um, this was 3486, NGC 3486. If you want to know what the names are, you can always see the name up at the top here. If you can't read that, then I will always throw the name into a uh, little... A label that will show up on the side here like this guy right here all right all right so we're now stacking and we've done two so far definitely got some good spiral. spiral arms what's that it's another barred spiral mm-hmm cool Seven point one by five point three arc minutes. So All it right. is on the small side. Yeah, we're at fifty percent right now, though, and you can see some nice detail. Mm. Let's see, we have a tiny satellite that came through right here. Let 
Let's go to auto and see the full screen. Okay, right here. And what do we got? Yeah. Okay, it looks light in the center here because I'm doing a uh, flat field correction. Oh boy. Another satellite zooming through. If I actually come in here. Galaxy on the left looks like a edge on spiral. Right there. Yeah. Let's just now. Hmm. I tell you a little something about domes, guys. Um, as you know, domes being round, they have a unique quality when it comes to sound, <laughs> and that is that wherever you play anything in a dome, a radio, music, let's say you're let's say you're playing, uh, you know, this 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 waltz here, the bittersweet waltz that we're listening to. If you played it on the other side of the dome. It goes up against the dome, but all of it comes back to the center of the dome. So no matter where you are, the music hits you on both sides of your ears, and it sounds like you're inside a stereo. It's just incredible. So domed buildings actually have those speci specific acoustics, which are just really, really fun. So I spent, I did that when I had a, I was working in a dome with a 35 or so foot long telescope. And uh, the dome was around uh, 45, uh, 45, 50 feet in diameter. And the acoustics in there were just incredible. Whatever you played came back at you and, and just like hit you. So we'd put a radio on the other side or we'd play a stereo with deep booming bass. Uh, not when we're observing, because when you're observing, you're getting it, you're gonna get this vibration and that would really ruin your shot. But when we're setting up the telescope, we play this music, and you hear the whole dome sound like you're inside a gigantic woofer speaker, and it was just incredible. A lot of fun. But then you gotta turn it off uh, when you start to observe. Very important. I was gonna say. Oh yeah. Okay, let's just drag the black level over just a little bit. Mike okay. says, small galaxy to the left is NDC 3510. This guy right here. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't look in the Stellarium to see. I bet he's right. <laughs> Tell you what, we're going to... Let's go in and zoom to 100% on this now because we've stacked nine of them. And aside from a little noise, it's probably going to be pretty good. There it is. Look at that. That's not bad. You know, I'm amazed. This telescope <clears throat> with this, it, this telescope runs 25 times faster than uh, you know, what it used to. This telescope is actually quite um, uh, quite a good uh, system now. And uh, let me just uh, remove my background so you can see through it again. Um, and being that fast, uh, you have a big field. Our field is four full moons across by three full moons tall. Okay, that's two degrees by one and a half degrees. And still, at the native... Uh, at the native uh, size of the image, okay, we can still see plenty of detail in here, which I think is pretty interesting. Yes, it's always better to have more focal length so you can magnify objects better. And that we, we don't have because we opted for wide angle. But we're working on getting a, a, a higher focal length system out in the same building. This is a Oofy. Seyfert galaxy. It's a low yeah, Seyfert, luminosity yeah. Seyfert galaxy, which sounds almost like a contradiction in terms, but uh, ah, but low luminosity in what in what band, in what wavelength, in the visual. But what about in the radio wave? What about in the radio spectrum? 
Uh, it's an active galaxy, like we talked about yeah, earlier. Yeah, so it's probably... And, which says... So it's uh, getting... An active galactic nucleus is a compact region, center of a galaxy, has a much higher than normal luminosity over at least some portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And, right, uh, which I think could it's include radio. Uh, basically everything but visible light. Excess radiation, yeah. but not necessarily visible. Uh, and right. it is ascribed to uh, uh, galaxy hosting an AGN. It's called an active galaxy. The non-stellar radiation from an AGN is theorized to result from the accretion of matter by a supermassive black hole at the center of yep. its host. AGN means active galactic nuclei, by the way. There's a lot of people do studies just on that. Ronald's here. <clears throat> You can see that this nucleus right there is uh, not necessarily that much brighter. Uh, and that's because the radiation this, this galaxy is giving off, as Daryl just said, is not in the visible spectrum in general. It's actually in uh, the radio spectrum or in another, uh, another part of the spectrum. <clears throat> uh, all the way up to camera. Jesse Peek is here. Hey, Jesse, what's up, brother? And Weird Guy. And NGC 3428 looks pretty cool, Weird Guy says. Yeah, it sure does. We've stacked uh, 14 of them. We're going to go to 15 and stop. All right. Nucleus so we'll is save it now. The rest of the galaxy. Yeah. Well, in general, nuclei of galaxies are, right? Well, yeah, excessively so. Uh, it doesn't seem excessive, um, but it could be. Save exactly a scene. But this is, you know, it's interesting because it's probably brighter in the other radiation that we can't see. Like we said, like you said, right. um, I'm gonna guess radio spectrum is probably. Uh, where this one lives, maybe not, but typically it's a radio, radio galaxy, radioactive, radio, not radioactive, but radio space active galaxy. All right, that's my thought anyway. All right, so we save this, uh, and and I saved it with the right name. That's good. So now we can clear it. Unless you want to do anything else, you want to look at anything else over there. Getting close to coma. Uh, yeah, we are. No radio or X-ray emission has been detected from the core. It may have. So then, what is it? It may, it may only have a small supermassive black hole, less than a million times the mass of the sun. It doesn't say what. So what it is, is it then? It just says no radio or X-ray emission. Huh. Has been detected. Interesting. It doesn't make sense. Well, that's all right. Okay, let's go back to. That's in Leo Minor, which I heard somebody mention earlier. It right. must have been it. That was it. I don't remember ever looking at anything in Leo Minor. <laughs> Probably have over time, but. Uh... It was just minor. It wasn't important. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Leo Leo has a little brother, folks. Leo Minor. That's He's right. right up next to the big lion. I don't know. You want to go on up into coma? Sure. And you see 4565 would be a showcase object. That's, I agree with you. <clears throat> Let's go check it out. And then we still have oh, wrong. the Leo triplet down below. You yeah, want I, I want to do uh, want to do forty five sixty. That's forty five sixty five. Yeah. Cause that's something that. Yeah, let's do that. Cause there's a lot more near it that we can look at too, which is kind of cool. And that's the needle galaxy. Yeah. And that's you'll see why this is called down the. Below it. Yeah, we're going to look at that, too. 
We have the koi fish galaxy. Isn't a whale nearby too? Uh, I forget. Okay, so let's check this out. The Neo Galaxy and Coma Berenice's is Berenice's hair. It's also known as the Flying Saucer Galaxy for those of you like Jesse Peak, who's a uh, mutual UFO network field investigator extraordinaire. All right, as you can see where the telescope's pointing, uh, we're actually pointing at part of the building, which is why you're going to see the building put a little bit of a red glow in here because on the end of the camera is a tiny red LED <laughs> and that red LED uh, is illuminating uh, the uh, illuminating the walls of the, uh, the observatory that's how sensitive the camera is okay we're gonna uh, we're going to uh, is this Vindia matrix here and then we're gonna go up out of the observatory which I knew we would do so we can get to a coma and see this galaxy. There's the needle. You can't miss it. This can't is an John spiral, folks. Yeah, I mean, look at the dark. You look at the dark dust lane through the middle. Just imagine that that's this galaxy is sort of what our galaxy looks like from the edge. All right, our galaxy is actually a barred spiral, by the way. It's not a spiral galaxy. We used to think it was. But it seems like we have this extended nucleus. We might actually be a barred spiral, but we can't really tell because we're inside the forest trying to figure out what the forest looks like from the outside. And it's hard. But we have ideas based on studying the Milky Way structure. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be really pretty. This is going to be gorgeous. Got another decent galaxy over on the right near the edge. Right here? Yeah, yeah. what is that? I don't know. It's a galaxy. I mean, there, there's galaxies all over the place here. You can't miss yeah. them. Could that be 4494? Yeah, it's NGC 4494 for sure. Okay. Okay. My gosh. Uh, folks, the words, the letters NGC stand for New General Catalog. New General Catalog. And the New General Catalog is a catalog of several thousand, around 8,000 or so, uh, or 7,000 objects, right? Well, I can't remember what the upper limit is on that. I don't remember. But in any case, and Daryl's looking it up right now, I can tell. Um, but no, the bottom line is that... I thought you were. Oh, you are? Okay, I got you. <laughs> I heard you clacking on the keyboard, and I figured, oh, he's looking it up. I was saying Okay, we got our... Oh, Shimon, hi, Shimon, how are you? Shimon, uh, yes, so how you, are you? What did you want to know? How many NGC objects? Uh, yeah, it's like 7,500, 7,800, uh, something like that. Something like that. Okay. Uh, Shivan says, could you show me Era and Temer? Um, Era and Temer? Are those stars? I don't know. Right now we're looking at NGC uh, 4565, which is a beautiful galaxy in Coma Berenices. Okay, and we're going to set our... This again does not need a lot of time because it's so beautiful, but we'll do 40 seconds anyway. 40 seconds. Uh, such a fun night, Rev. Such a good time. Seven thousand eight hundred forty. Uh, okay, so this is not seventy-eight hundred. Okay, I'm not going out of my mind. Okay, let's do this. Let's jump out of this. We're gonna live stack. Uh, I have a question. Okay. We're in Coma Berenices, aren't we? Yes, we are. Of course, we are. Why? Why is Ber Bernice's hair? so well loved that they put it in the sky well this is a trivia question isn't it sort of yeah I think you told us this once in one of our sky tour radio shows I think I did yeah uh, does anybody in chat Bernice. know don't tell don't, don't tell don't tell don't tell anybody let's see if anyone out in chat knows Look at this galaxy. Holy cow. 
Yeah. So the question is from Daryl. Repeat your question so people can uh, take a shot at it. Coma Berenices is a constellation in the spring sky. It sits above and between Virgo and Leo. Why was Berenice, Berenice, Berenike, they would have said back in the day, why was she so well loved that they put her hair in the sky? Uh, you've got a well, there's your question. You're really close under to the lower right there. Right there. Yeah, right there. We got one here. That's a probably a, either an SA or an elliptical uh, E0. That looks like an SA type galaxy, a very, very tightly wound spiral. Isabella uh, says, I don't know. Yeah, she doesn't know. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Oh, well. Oh, that's not true. Tell uh, us. Berenike, if I remember all the story, she was a priestess uh, back in the back in the good old days, way back thousands of years ago. I forget which god. I'd have to look that up. Uh, her husband went off to war, and Berenike made an oh. offering of her beautiful hair. She was known for having beautiful hair, and yep. uh, she made an offering to the gods of her hair. Uh, praying that her husband would come back safe for more. And he did, and she was happy, and they put her hair up in the sky to commemorate the event. Wow. And, wow. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, that's great. See that fine dark line? Uh, that's the dust That's lane it. in the galaxy, and it's the galaxy is tilted almost exactly on edge on to our line of sight. It's like that to us, and we see galaxies like this. We see them like this. We see them like that. This is one of those edge ons, like Daryl Daryl saying. And that dust lane, all galaxies in their spiral arms have this dark dust. You know, when we look in Orion, we took the pictures of Orion right up front. Okay. Those the dust that you see in Orion is part of vast dust lanes in our galaxy, so that from the edge our galaxy would have a dust lane. And this dust lane that you see here, uh, for instance, might be this galaxy's dust lane with where its Orion Nebula a molecular cloud is located. Okay, of course, Orion is only in our galaxy, but I'm saying a similar cloud like in ours. Uh, might exist here for sure and there it is you're watching it looking at it right there this is uh one of the nicest photos we've ever taken of this i'm thinking this is really pretty uh baron icy too she was queen of egypt she sacrificed her long hair as a votive offering so there It was introduced okay. to Western astronomy in 300 BC. Wow. So it's been around a long time. <clears throat> oh, and she was bald for a long time. <laughs> I guess so. Right? Well, if she well, sacrificed her hair grew back. it, yeah. And if it didn't grow back, yeah, but I'm, I'm thinking it probably grew back. Oh, sure. Yeah. I wonder if they burned it. Probably did. <laughs> that stinks. Well, that's burning hair smells terrible. Yeah, I guess. Notice the colors in here, guys. The, the dark lanes here actually—they're not black. They're actually brown, and that's typical of these dark dust. And the one thing you notice, by the way, you can actually see that this is not quite on edge. It's not perfectly on edge like this. It's more like this. It's tilted slightly upward to our line of sight. So you can see more of the bottom here than the top. And you can actually see how this, this spiral arm kind of starts to curl around a little bit. You know, so you're actually watching this three. You're seeing it in 3D, basically. Yeah. You know, we see something very similar, though, when we look at the Milky Way. Yeah. Uh, as you look at that, if you imagine the lower left is the northern Milky Way, 
and then the nucleus there is would be equivalent between uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius. And then yep. when you see the dark stuff in the upper right, which would be the southern Milky Way, you can kind of see uh, the dark uh, the dark lanes sort of break up like that in our galaxy as well. That's right. Can Let's, we zoom uh, in on that a little more? Yeah, right. in a moment. Just, yeah. Just a second. I'm Actually, just you just to... caught it, what I was wanting to look at. Just now? Yeah, uh, if you look in the very center of the nucleus, immediately below the dark lane, you can see the brightest part of the nucleus right there. It's right like there, it's actually yeah. yeah showing up right there against that dark lane, just beneath it. Yep. Well, I'm at 100%, but let's go to 150% and see what it looks like. Yeah, All right, so there's 150%. Like. Yeah, right there. Yeah, and this is this, this part here is closest to us, and this part here is actually farthest from us. It's on the other side of that nucleus, way out there. This is closest, and it goes all the way around into the distance, into the page, and then it comes around again. So we're actually looking at a gigantic disk. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> Weird guy says the uh, Milky Way might have warped, uh, has have a warped shape, influenced by the Magellanic clouds. That's true. We have the large and small Magellanic clouds. There's even a dwarf galaxy in addition to those two that might be associated with us, and that as well could uh, be causing uh, a warpage to our galactic disk. This is the galactic disk. This galaxy, the needle, is actually out uh, on its own. And uh, so it doesn't have anything quite nearby that can influence it and cause a warpage of its disk. All right. So it's it's just sitting out there and doesn't have a warp to it. You see a small this one here? galaxy at 12 o'clock from it. No, directly above the nuclear. Oh, this guy? Yeah. Don't know if that's a satellite galaxy or just one farther away. Oh, no. Let's find out. The one to the lower right looks like... Uh, yeah. Uh, let me... Uh, we ID'd that one before, didn't we? Yeah, you know what I have to do? I have to uh, come in here and... 4494. Yeah, but when I, before I do that, though, um, I have to go into DSOs and... I want to take our Caldwells, our Sharpless, Barnard, our Lund's Bright Nebula, Lard's Lund's Dark Nebula. And we'll do Melots as well as, uh, what might this be? Colander? No, that's not right. No, that's Clusters. It's probably going to be... Um, one of these oh a trumpler might be a trumpler object All right so we'll have that and not the stock no when you go back to the Pre stellarium view Our atlas of peculiar galaxies okay yep let's just try that and see if that does it for us okay Okay. Um. And you see, uh, forty-four ninety-four is the one to the right. This little guy, the one above this, is that the one that we see at twelve o'clock? Uh, let's find out. That's forty-five fifty-five, and it's an elliptical galaxy. Let's go back. To this. Well, we're zoomed right in right now, so I don't think that that's correct. No. I think that's, this. Go ahead. That's the one uh, to we the got, upper left in the Sclerium view, isn't it? See, we got one here, we got one here, we've got yeah. one here, and one here. And then the one big, other big one is off to the right hand side. Yes, that's. Outside the field of view at present. 
Well, it's over here. There it is. Yeah. Okay, so if we come back here. Let's go in here and look. Um, that's 4494. That's off to the right. Just out of view. Uh, sort of out of view. Um, not from the position of the scope, I should say. Um, okay. But there's also a couple of galaxies that we're not able to see. 4555. Okay, there they are. That's that's okay. That's that little galaxy we just saw. It yeah. shows up when you zoom in. Yeah. That's uh, index catalog thirty five eighty two, and it's an SAB galaxy. Um, its magnitude is thirteen point eight. All right, that's a that's a very faint galaxy, but we can see it. That's cool. Uh, yes, it's galaxy season. Lots of galaxies everywhere. It is. Really pretty. It's a nice picture. Yeah. All right, well, we have uh, 18. So we'll pause it here. And we'll save it, and then save exactly a scene. And I've got NGC 4565 as the name, so we're good with that. Save exactly a scene. I remember the first time I talked to you and looking at this. I do too. It was with the other telescope. Yep, you had never seen it before. I had never seen it. And it was really stunning, even here. I was just like, wow, that's beautiful. Jesse, thanks for coming by. We'll talk to you again. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, let's uh, get out of this. Let's let's push that over so I can see my scope. There we go. All right, and now we'll uh, clear this and get rid of this. We don't need that. We'll come up here now, and let's change our time now to one second. One second while I get one second, and then I will go to a hybrid mode where we do this beautiful intensified view. That's a one oh. second exposure. Yeah. Uh, Black Eye Galaxy, which we yep. saw on Slurium earlier. Yep. Also Messier 100, Messier 98, and you see 4651. There's a ton of galaxies here. Oh, I know. I mean, Messier 85, Messier 99. It goes uh, on and on. Messier 88. Yep. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, there are. Messier 91. I don't think we'll get to all of them. I don't think we will either. But you know what we're going to do is we're going to get to... I'm going to get to the Black Eye Galaxy because that's really pretty. Right. Um, is it you known as... You can pick off a few of the Messiers at any rate. Yeah. What's Black Eye Galaxy? Is it going to show up as Black Eye Galaxy, I wonder? Yeah. I bet it does, yeah. It does. All right, so the Black Eye Galaxy is nearby. It's not far away from here. Well, uh, there it was, so back out of here. It's right out down at the bottom of the screen. Well, well I have it. There's, that's where the scope is. I already have it on the Black Eye. Oh. Um, but you know what's actually uh, coming up is Omega Centauri. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to try it, even though I know it's really low. There it is. That's Omega Centauri. Oh, that's the Rose Cluster. Where's Omega Centauri? It was over here. Are we not waiting long enough? Is it still coming up? Let me get rid of the ground and find out where it is. We might have to wait longer in the season here. See, there's measure 13 right there. Uh, 
I is that Omega Centauri? No, that's not no. Omega Centauri. No, uh, it's over here, isn't it? It's to the lower right of Scorpius. Because it's like ten degrees above my horizon once it's up high enough to see. So that's got to be this then. No, it's not. I actually saw it earlier. Not visually, but... Okay. Well, it's not ready anyway. Let's get the ground back. Oh, there it is. It's just coming up now. You see it? I saw that. Well, give it a while. We'll give it a... Yeah, see? There it shot. is. It's, yeah. it's, it's not rising yet. Okay, well... Then we have, of course, this other galaxy, Centaurus A, right above it, which we'll have a better shot of seeing. Yep. Well, let's go to the Black Eye Galaxy right now. All right. There's the Black Eye Galaxy. No, that's not. What did I do? I missed it. Let me go back. Get it again. There we go. Okay. Let's go with the Black Eye now. I want a Black Eye. Don't you want a Black Eye? I've had one or two. Yeah. Telescope's going to go kind of low right now, and we're going to get partially into the uh, building. A um, little bit of the building will get in the way, but that's okay. <clears throat> and Vindimatrix is... Vindimatrix is centering up. <clears throat> and it's for low objects like Omega Centauri, the most beautiful globular cluster in the sky, probably, that um, it's for that reason that we're doing what we're doing with the pedestals that are going to, the lifting columns that are going to lift the telescope up in the air. Oh man, this is going to be a pretty shot too, I can tell you that. Oh yeah, beautiful. Black Eye Galaxy has a particularly dark patch right on one side it's asymmetric it makes it an asymmetric looking galaxy it's pretty cool all right we're gonna wait for it to capture a guide star and then we're gonna come in and do a 35 second shot because that's all it needs in fact that's probably too much all right so we should have our guide star by now. And go into the stack. Black Eye Galaxy is a Messier object, isn't it? I don't recall. I do not recall. Oh, let's find out. Oh, look at that, Daryl. No, it's not. I thought it was. It is. Messier 64. Okay. This is really pretty. Okay. That's really sharp, pristine. Let's let's zoom in on this. I think we'll, it'll support it. Let's do it at 50% right now. Oh, look at that. Look at the detail. That is really pretty. What if you stack up on that and zoom oh, in? Oh, yeah. On. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go right to 100% now. We'll have some noise, but that'll go away. Look at how sharp that dark lane is in there. Yeah. 
That's pretty. More like an eyebrow than a black eye. That's true. Maybe if you turned it upside down. I guess. Let's uh, just dump a little bit of the darkness here. Get some of that. Interesting. Soften it up a little bit. I go into enhancements, and I think I've got the bilateral filter on. If I turn it off, how does it look? Okay. We're going to let that uh, stack up. Night, Mike. Thanks, Mike, for coming by. Great options uh, for the telescope tonight. Thank you for making suggestions. Join us again. Thanks for stopping by. So as we're sitting here, we're stacking, and most of you know what this is, right? We take a picture, we take another picture, we align them together so they're exactly lined up with each other, and we sandwich them, and we create this image sandwich. And as we do, we pump up and, and bring out the signal, the things we want, like the stars, uh, like the black eye in the galaxy, the spiral arms that are subtle, and the noise, which is this, this, this mottled color that you see along the edge. This gets subdued more and more and more the more we stack. We've only stacked six, but in that time, stacking six, as you can see now seven, uh, we've already made a significant uh, better image than we had before. And that's what's beautiful about this whole process of doing the stacking, especially doing it on the fly like this. Let me see if the color rendering will help with the color of the galaxy a little bit. Interesting. Very nice. I have up a Hubble telescope image of wow. the black the black eye. There's all sorts of H2 regions inside the uh, the dark cloud that makes the black eye. I've seen that image. They're in here. This is the dark black eye. Uh -huh. Well, David, that's the David says. Uh, amazing when one thinks about it. They name it the Needle Galaxy, uh, and indeed it looks thin. Uh, but why, he says, I'll bet it's not more than a few gazillion miles wide and only a few billion thick. <laughs> Actually, um, it's measured in light years, David. So um, galaxies tend to be l many light years thick and many light years across. Our galaxy is like over 100,000 light years across. So light starting at one end takes 100,000 years to cross over to the other end. Um, for a galaxy like the Needle Galaxy, I'm not sure how big it is relative to ours. But uh, in cases like that, we would actually see uh, that the, the galaxy could be um, 100,000, 200,000 light years across and maybe, uh, you know, five to 10,000 light years thick at the, at the nucleus. So it's, it's possible that, that, you know, these galaxies are way bigger than they appear, but because they're so far away, we can't really adequately judge how thick they are, for instance. We could measure them, and once we know their distance, we can measure the size. And if it's on edge, then that's a very good indicator. We can get the size of the nucleus. And we could calculate the actual width of the nucleus, actually. Maybe we'll do that as an exercise. Because um, we do know the distance, and I can measure the size, and we can actually figure out a lot of physical parameters of the galaxy just from a photograph. 
Look at these spiral arms. They're really showing up nicely, Daryl. Uh-huh. This is 11 stacked, and now that noise we had on the outside is gone. See that? I'm just amazed at how well this system supports magnifying. I'm, I'm doing what's called a push right now. I'm actually trying to get some of the faint detail out here to come in. And as you can see. Now see these objects here? One, two, three, four. I'm not sure if those are field stars or globular clusters in this galaxy. They could be field stars in our galaxy. Just like we know these are stars in our galaxy. And we could have three that are... You know, between us and the galaxy is that what they are or are those globular clusters in that galaxy first of all this galaxy is let's get the distance how many millions of light years is this uh, this is 24 million light years away so it's 24 million years old than the light that we're seeing from it um, so at 24 million light years would we see a globular cluster that size seems a little big to me but you never know because Omega Centauri might be visible in, in this galaxy as might be some of the other globular clusters that are a little larger and they can have you know a hundred thousand stars or more and so they would they might show up um, 4565 the needle galaxy it's a giant spiral galaxy it's more luminous than Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, blah, blah. They think it's a barred spiral galaxy. Okay. Has a couple of, has at least two satellite galaxies, one of which is interacting with it. Has more globular clusters than the Milky Way does, 240. Okay. Uh, its apparent size is 15.9 arc minutes by 1.85 so roughly 16 by 2 or mm -hmm. it's 8 times as wide as it is deep yeah Isabella says it's always amazing how much data astronomers can extract by looking just at light well, think about it. That's all we've got, Isabella. That's all we've got. We don't have anything else other than uh, sample return missions, so to say asteroids. But looking at astronomical objects, all we ever have is the light. Now, radio is also light. You know, ultraviolet light is also light. Obviously, infrared is light. Heat is light. Isn't that weird? You think of heat as, oh, it feels warm. Actually, you're getting hit with infrared energy which is a form of light out in the red end of the spectrum beyond what you can see. And so um, it, it's all light. It's all a form of energy. It's all wavelengths of different uh, energies that are striking you and coming into your telescope sensor. That's all we've got. And from that we can figure out, as you said, many, many different parameters. In fact, we can, we can solve mysteries just by looking at the light. That's true. Okay, we've stacked 18 here, so this is good for this, this object. Look at that, though. Those spiral arms are just beautiful. I am really, really, really pleased. Oh, yeah. this, came out, this came out better than anything we've seen. Uh, it's the best black eye image I've ever taken, I think, with the telescope, don't you think? Sure. Will it zoom in more? Yeah, I can support that. Let's do that. We're at 100% now. Let's, uh... Should we go to 200%? Let's double our zoom. Douche. Oh, yeah. And the black eye there, I, I don't think he can really differentiate the uh, H2 regions in it, but it does have a reddish cast to it. It does. It does. Let me try a color correction to see if that makes any difference. Yeah, it didn't really. Let's, um... Let's try and pull some data, soften it to try and see if we can see any more detail in there. 
you notice the the galaxy you can see it really clearly is laying kind of in a three-quarter view to us here mm. i do see a reddish cast though in some yeah. of this yeah it's very interesting wow <clears throat> Wow, I like that. That's nice. Yep. All right. Well, that one is a winner. I'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> I remember that. That was a slogan for cigarettes. Uh, what what brand, though, was it? The Terryton? That was the first thing I was thinking was Terryton. That was my mother and father's cigarette they smoked, and I hated it. I I never I I couldn't eat dinner because they would start smoking, you know, as soon as dinner was done. Okay, let's see, we're done here, so let's save this. Um, first of all, let's put the black eye galaxy in here. Um, what was the measure number? Sixty four. Yes. Um, yes, that's okay. Uh, black eye. No, come on. Uh, I'm still waiting for our Etherlink cable for the Starlink system, which is in full operation out in the desert. Yours is probably in operation over in uh, Ukraine. Hmm. They're sending everything over there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, there we go. So now we'll save the Black Eye Galaxy. That's good. That's the astronomical file. Uh, an item couldn't be uploaded to one drive. Okay, we're going to figure that out. Save exactly as seen. I will fix that problem. It had to do with the renaming thing, that's all. Okay, let's zoom back out to... Autofill. You, you want another target? I mean, it'll be never ending, but yes. Uh, well, would you like to keep it to Messier objects? Oh, uh, yeah, we can do Messiers. Okay, Messier 100. Okay, that's nearby. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> let's, um. Let's first of all get back here and give a one second shout out here. <clears throat> Do this. And go to 40%. And bring us up to speed. There we go. All right. And now let's go over. And we're doing Messier 100. Okay. Well, before we do that, should we look at Messier 3, which is right nearby? Sure. Okay. All right. Let's just let's look at Messier 3 while we're here. It's a very nice globular. Yeah. NGC 5272, a little tiny globular cluster. We're going to go look at it now. Well, not so tiny, but, you know. It is 32,000 light years away, so it's actually quite far. Yeah, we're probably going to go to Vindimatrix again. That looks like Vindimatrix up at the top, trying to be brought in. Let's drop it down, do an auto. Yeah, let me see. Oh, Mufford. Mufford. Yeah, Mufford. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Okay, and then we'll go to Mesher 3. Zing. And back up out of the uh, wall of the observatory now, and there's our beautiful globular cluster. Now, what's interesting is we haven't seen globular clusters since we started doing our critical focusing. 
So our globular clusters are now going to be really, really pretty and really perfectly focused, which is something that we haven't had up to this point. I think this is the first time we're looking at a globular uh, with the perfect focus. Let's zoom in though and make sure that we've got perfect focus going on. Go to 100%. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's going to be really pretty. So let's do this. Let's do a uh, 20 second shot. 20 seconds. Yeah, see, I just caught myself there. I knew what I was doing. 20 seconds. And we're going to get out of here, go into a stack. And uh, this is measure three. And it's a GC, globular cluster. Once it comes in, we'll be able to uh, do a little processing on it. Oh, my God. Boom. Boom. Like, boom. Very condensed toward the center. It is. I'm going to just monkey with a few things here. And we're going to get this. We're going to get this all looking good. And to do that, we're going to do this. We're going to pull this down. Yeah. Let's droop it down even more. You know what I'm thinking? Uh, I'm thinking that maybe I might want to do critical focus again. Because these look like they might be just a little out of focus. They might not, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna go to 200% just to see. Hmm. Yeah, they are. Yep. Okay. Cool. So we, we can are, get. We're actually in Canada's Venetici now. The hunting dogs. Yeah, we're actually uh, we're way over. Right, we're, we're like in the northeast. Here's one I didn't know. Messier three was the first Messier object to actually be discovered by Charles Messier himself. Really? Who, who discovered Messier 1? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Good question. I'd have to look. Okay. Um, we're going to get rid of this stack here, and we're going to go back to our hypered finder-like view. And then we're going to uh, what is this doing? Let's see what this does. Okay, I'm going to set us to forty percent. <clears throat> okay. All right. Now what I'll do is. We have our one second timing. So what I'm going to do now is go back in and go into the focus assistant. But first I'm going to come in here and I'm going to, I'm going to take the focus out. Okay. Now that the focus is out, I'm going to scan in and get a much better focus. And I'll bet you that this little cluster is gonna look spectacular when we're done. If I keep doing this long enough, we'll be able to see measure 13. <laughs> All right, so here we go, in. All right. And now we just sit back and let the telescope figure this out. I like letting the telescope figure things out. Monday, uh, I filmed the next season of A&E's The Proof Is Out There. And uh, they'll be here at 8 o'clock in the morning on Monday. And I 
I, my, I took receipt of all the equipment, um, which is in my uh, special effects shop sitting in, the, in there right now. And we're going to use that to film and do all the stuff we have to do. So you'll see me at the same computer that I have here, but doing analysis and video and video photography analysis. This is a really good curve. Check that out. It already has a central focus point at the center, the vertex of this parabola. And uh, it's queuing now. It's on 11. All right. So it's way out here, way out of focus. And now we're going to find that it's done. And I can go to best position and watch how this comes into focus now. So it's going to go all the way across. It's going to come into focus, go out of focus, and then come back down into the best focus position. And there we have it. So now, now we are in a position where we have really sharply focused stars now. And I think it's going to be just a bit different. Okay. So let's now drag this over. And let's zoom in again to make sure that it did what we say it did. What's your show's name again on A&E? It's called The Proof is Out There. Do they show that on the main channel? I don't remember ever seeing that. Uh, I think it's, uh, well, a &E owns History Channel. It's on History. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, these are beautifully focused. So now we're going to do the same thing. Uh, and I'll leave it at 100% because these stars typically do very well under these conditions. So I'm going to take this and we're going to do another 20 second shot. Beautiful. Okay. And let's stack it too. And we're going to clear it. See, those are out of focus. The next shot you can see is really going to be sharply focused. It's going to be looking nice. It's be looking nice. Oh, look at that. Wow. Ah. Just stunning. Yeah, that's beautiful. Now I'm going to just drag it down. There we go. It helps. Okay, and then we're just going to drag this back slightly. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? It is. Wow. And this is at 100%, and it already looks nice. Look at that. Wow. Mm mm mm. This cluster is 32,000 light years away. Uh, so, uh, the stars, we're seeing these stars through some uh, fairly, fairly significant dust. Um, and so, the stars are going to look redder uh, for the same reason that the sunset looks red. It's looking through dust. And the dust scatters the blue light. So, they start to look a little bit redder. All right, so, the stars in these clusters, these stars are among the oldest stars in the galaxy. And... Uh, they are uh, very poor in elements other than hydrogen and helium. They don't have a lot of like magnesium and calcium and phosphorus and sulfur uh, in their atmospheres because a lot of those elements, when these stars were made to make these clusters, a lot of these stars, uh, they were made in a, a, a nebulae that never had those elements because those elements come from supernovae explosions. These stars are old. They're they've around from the almost the beginning of the uh, uh, formation of the galaxy at times. So um, you see that they 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 have a dearth or a lack of these heavier elements. Um, and we call every other element other than hydrogen and helium is a metal, and that's 
a misnomer. There's not obviously neon is not a metal. Okay, neither is boron. Okay, um, actually, and so when you talk about um, other materials in the periodic table, okay, these stars here are mostly hydrogen and helium. What's that also mean? It means also that these stars also are in a, uh, this is 237% by the way, so even there it's supporting it. Um, I'll go to 100. Uh, it also tells us that these stars are very, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. These stars don't have planets. Um, the only way they could have planets is if as they come zipping through, they, 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 they orbit the galaxy, but they'll go, they'll go plunging through the galactic plane, the galactic disk, and they might shed stars or pick up stars as they do that. So you might get some stragglers that are left behind or some stragglers or, or some new stars that actually attach to the globular clusters as they pull them with their mutual gravity. Um, how globular clusters form is a mystery. Uh, we do not know how they form. Um, as far as I know, I haven't seen any principles that illustrate how globular clusters form. Though stars and globular mm. clusters tend to be some of the oldest in the galaxy. Right. They're called population two stars, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, as we mentioned, they're, they, they are among the oldest, like from when the galaxy was formed. Those stars were formed at that time, and they formed in these clusters using a mechanism that we don't, I don't think, really understand. Um, but that's okay. You know, I like mysteries. I've, I've puzzled how global clusters could form for a long, long time. Um, were these, were these f uh, formed from knots of hydrogen gas? actual super bubbles of hydrogen gas uh, that were actually fairly dense and so many stars formed at once think about what's going on in there very very complex gravitational interactions these stars are orbiting each other well they're not they're not they're not just static they're actually gravitationally bound and there's this is what's going on at all times you just can't see it because it's frozen in time you know we don't see that Isabella asks how the stars and globular clusters die uh, they uh, swell into red giants when they will go and they'll swell like the Sun um, and uh, these stars don't generally go supernova because I think their masses are lower yeah. um, and so They'll fade away into white dwarfs. They might leave planetary nebulae, but guess what? Um, we don't see uh, any but maybe one or two globular clusters that actually have in them an actual planetary nebula. So uh, that's really an interesting finding because it shows that none of those stars have died yet. If there are massive young hot stars, they would have obliterated themselves billions of years ago. But we could don't see you, any gas associated with them. Go ahead, could, I'm sorry. Could you say uh, what uh, stellar class globular stars tend to be? Um, Similar to the sun or, or dimmer? I would, they're, I would, they're evidently, they're very long-lived stars. Right, so they're gonna be, they're gonna be probably similar, maybe lower mass stars in the sun. Okay, um, slightly lower mass. Maybe they're gonna be uh, you know, uh, G type, K type stars. I don't know. Um, but that's a, a good question. But they tend to all be the same, except again for stragglers that might have been picked up in the galactic disk if they went in orbit. I've actually never heard of any stars that are picked up or shed from galactic in the galactic disk. But we actually haven't seen uh, this going on because it's such a long term process. I thought I had heard that some early globular clusters may have uh, formed the nuclei of galaxies. I don't quote know, me on that, but I've seen them. You know what? As good a theory as any. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I just know the globular clusters, what we call halo objects, they actually orbit the galaxy. Um, and for large galaxies, they're going to go plunging through that galactic disk. And when they do, 
uh, they're going to basically not punch a hole, but they're going to actually drag with their gravity some stars with it or leave behind some stars possibly on the outer fringes. Uh, that's a possibility. Okay, this global cluster has been saved. And I'm now going to... Uh, I just wanted to get a nice globular cluster. This is beautiful. Yeah. You know, though, if you're in Canada's going to teach you now, mm -hmm. you know what I'm going to say next. No, what? Well, it starts with an M. Messier? <laughs> and then the next character is five. Mm hmm. And the next character is a one. M51. I know it is. M51, yep. Well, we are in the northeast. I just don't know how low it is. If you look at the telescope yeah, there. Yeah, oh, that's, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so I think we're going to have to discover uh, where it is relative to where we are now. Um, let me bring up the boundaries. Okay. I mean, gee, there's booties right there. Or yeah, dirt. I know. I mean, we're going to have... Uh, Should be higher up. Well, we're here, right? Yeah. And here is, you know, the, the uh, uh, Big Dipper, right? Yep, that's so, the handle. Alcade, yeah. Mizar, Alion. Yeah. So, I mean, we're actually right near. Those two stars with a line between them, they just went out of view up on the upper right. Yeah. I think is uh, Canada's Venetici. Yeah, and then we have, like... Whirlpool right here, which is what you there want to is. see. Yeah. Okay. Well, why not? Why not? It's been such a good night for everything else. Let's give it a try. It's going to be 55 degrees up. We'll see it. We also have the Pinwheel Galaxy, but it is yep. uh, it is 1.30 in the morning, and I do have to uh, be up, believe it or not, at okay. some point. So I'm going to... Well, you want to make this a last object then? Yeah, it's worth it. It's a good object to end with, but you know All what? All right. Yeah. I need you know to go me. to bed sometime soon, too. No, you don't. We don't need to do that. We don't need no in bedtime. Oh, I do. I've been going to bed early lately. Okay. We're centering on Alcade right there, as you can see. Alcade uh, in the Big Dipper. I think it's the N star in the Big Dipper. The handle on in the actual Big Dipper asterism. And then we're going to go from Alcade. We're going to jump over to just a very short distance away okay right there and go to the whirlpool galaxy which you're going to see right there wham can't miss it here it Isabella, is Isabella you like galaxies uh, well I'm not sure you've seen M51 before but uh, <clears throat> well now she will this is a showcase galaxy if there ever was one yeah yeah, get out your processing hat, Isabella. You're going to have fun with this one. As will I. I always have fun with this. Okay. One more jog. And there we go. So now... Uh, I'll guess that our focusing is still fine. Uh, but you know what? Just to be safe, I'm always going to check. I always check. Go to 100%, see if we've got good focus. Oh, yeah. We sure look like we do. All right. And now what I'll do is go back down to auto. I saw the I saw the Whirlpool in a 41-inch reflector telescope once. Oh, that must have been beautiful. Oh, it was stunning. One of the most stunning things I ever saw. Wow. It was out in a dark sky location, too, here up in the mountains wow. of Colorado. Wow. Well, 30 seconds, guys. The bad part, I was on a ladder about 15 feet up in the air. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't see my hand in front of my face, and it was kind of disturbing. Yeah, I bet it was. And it was a Dobsonian telescope. Uh, it did not have go-to. It oh was 
it was motor driven. Wow. But uh, this was back in the late 90s, I guess, uh, 97. Wow. Something like that. And uh, when the guy drove the telescope, it was a stepper drive, altitude and azimuth. And mm. the telescope sounded like a calliope as it ran. Just, uh, <laughs> yes, constantly. Yeah. And uh, it was really funny. Uh, look at this. Wow. You can see the blue uh, disc stars. These are the ones that are young and hot. That's why the disc is blue. This is another galaxy that has interacted with the Whirlpool galaxy. And we're actually watching a collision between two galaxies. This part of the disc of the Whirlpool galaxy is actually warped in such a way as it's, it's reaching for this other galaxy. It's, it's a really strange thing in 3D. Um, it's beautiful, though. This is beautiful. Let me get... Let me see what I've got uh, going on here. Okay, I took off the blur. Let me increase the unsharp mass to like 1.5. And you can see it sharpens up a little bit there. See that? Really pretty. Okay, let's uh, now go back to our histogram, which is our data. This is this is all the data we're getting right here, all this stuff down here. This yellow line represents the cross-section through the data that we're looking at. So if I slide this guy over, that yellow line climbs up that histogram on the left that you see, and we see it get brighter, all right, like this, all right. And then this line here, this is our dark level. And if I move it to the left, well, then our screen gets brighter because we're actually making a brighter background. But if I pull it to the right, all right, at the peak, that's where the the light level is uh, at the point where you want to start clipping it out to get your dark sky in the back. So by doing this, okay, we darken up our background. And the more we darken the background, the more detail we'll see. But we got to be careful because... See this subtle glow right here? We yeah. could lose that if we push too far. I was going Vera, to say, above the thank you, Vera. Right there, there's some. Uh, this here? Yeah, faint, yeah. faint uh, detail there. Yeah, I don't think we've ever seen that. Let's zoom in some more, shall we? Let's go to 100% on this. Oh, look at that. That's really pretty. It is. You can see all these these H2 regions. That's, that's the uh, the uh, illuminated uh, regions of the red that you see, the nebulae, these distant galaxies, stellar nurseries, uh, ionized hydrogen regions known as H2. That's H Roman numeral 2. Um, and that means ionized hydrogen. And you know, we talk about ionized hydrogen. You say, well, why isn't it just H1 then, H Roman numeral 1? Because every atom, when it has all its electrons, is Roman numeral one. We just don't say it. So calcium one is a calcium atom with all its electrons. Uh, helium one is a helium atom with its two electrons, etc. Um, but you know, if you have hydrogen two, that means that the electron has been bumped off the atom and it's been ionized. That's what ionization is, when the electron gets pounded off the atom by some of the ultraviolet energy. Look at this convolution right here. This is really pretty. This is going to support some more uh, zooming, I can tell you that. Yeah, you've got a lot of faint detail there below, too. I do. Isabel asks, what is the dark in the smaller one? Uh, the dark in the smaller one, again, is the same kind of thing that you see in this galaxy. It is the dark dust uh, that presumably was part of this galaxy's dark dust uh, that has been grabbed and or uh, mixed with uh, the smaller galaxies. Uh, and these two galaxies yeah. are, are mixing with each other. Yep. Interesting thing to notice here, and something I've always noticed in the Whirlpool, which I find fascinating. We zoom in, and you'll notice that this spiral arm, look at the weird shape. It's almost like you're seeing this being pulled in that direction. Uh -huh. Look at this bow right here. Like it's being pulled in that direction. It is. 
Exactly. That's the point. And so when you look at this, you're watching gravity on grand scales. Okay, uh, you know, 75,000 light years of gravitational pull affecting this. And these here, these, these galact this galactic disk is actually warping toward this galaxy that it's interacting with. Uh, when you see that bow that you mentioned there, uh, right there, right there if you follow that around to the left and down a bit, you can see there's a discontinuity in that spiral line. Right here, you mean? Yep, with a big dark block in it, and uh, right here, yeah, like whatever's been disturbing the next star amount. Yeah, make me wonder which direction the uh, the satellite galaxy is moving relative to the uh, main galaxy. Cause it looks almost like it passed to the left, maybe from the left toward the upper left, or it's moving toward the upper right, and uh, you know has pulled all that out of place. Yeah, that's a question for uh, some galaxy specialists who have actually studied this this system. Um, and I know it's been done. I know they've studied it. This is going to produce a gorgeous photograph in processing. I can tell you that. Uh, just to give a little hint here, let's 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 pump up the unsharp mass to just over two. Okay. When you right. see the spiral arm that's toward the bottom of the galaxy and looping up to the upper left toward the satellite galaxy. You see how much bigger that dark gap is between uh, it and the next spiral arm in. This one here? Uh, no, go down toward, toward about 8 o'clock from the center. Right here? The big dark void right there, you see how much that whole spiral arm outside that looks like it's been pulled away. Yeah, so maybe... It, well, you know what? Maybe it came from here and it's moving this way, but then it's it's a complex orbit. There's some there's some orbiting going on here that we're not aware of, I'm sure. Okay, let me see if I can just go all the way up for the heck of it. I guess what I'm saying it looks like the uh, the lower left hand quadrant from six o'clock to nine o'clock has been distorted, also. Yeah actually distorted a great deal with that big yeah empty dark uh, dark place inside indeed right, let me uh let's do this here so 1.5 let's say the amount let's go with the amount let's raise the amount here hmm. you talked about focal length earlier getting a telescope yes. with more focal length and yeah well it's kind of begging the question but for doing live streams like this I mean will you be able to produce useful work off of uh, you're talking longer focal length you're talking longer f ratio and yep. therefore longer longer exposures. photographic times yeah yeah are you gonna be able to get away with that sure why not because the bottom line is this telescope will be running at the same time you know, David Schmidt, thanks for coming. We'll talk Good to you night. soon. Good night, David. Wow. Yeah, I think we'll be able to do we'll be able to do that. And the reason is because, like I said, this telescope will still be running concurrently with it, and we'll actually be able to go between the two telescopes. That's the whole point. So we'll actually see telescope A. We'll be looking at the, this guy here, and like for instance, as we're watching this, there's another exposure that would be being done on the other telescope. Yes. And so we could say, well, let's go check out the higher focal length version of this image right now. We go check it out. It's like, oh, wow, check at this. Check this out. So in other words, it's going to actually be like a, a, a symphony of two telescopes running together. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you realize you a we're at 167% here. So we're actually, we're actually quite a, we're, we're quite zoomed in, you know. If we go back to the full frame here, not full frame, but we go back to the uh, the actual size of the sensor, that's where we are. Look at that. I mean, I, I'm seeing other stuff out here that is just amazing. There's a lot of detail out here. You sent me a picture you said. I'm sorry. Um, 
It was, uh, I sent you a link to a video by that, uh, look at that Astro Backyard guy. Yeah, yeah, Trevor. I don't remember what it was now. Uh, but he was, it was a picture that we've taken, and he did it with an 11 inch Celestron working at F7. Yeah. And instead of, you know, I made the point at the time that, uh, he had like four hours of data in that image. Yeah. No, that's amazing how much detail you're... You see that fine line of it working out to the upper right right there? Yeah. Yeah. That's really something. Yeah, this this shows that these galaxies, these, these two may have actually interacted deeper than we thought. Mm -hmm. well, look at this. This is just stunning. You know, I'm really stretching. I'm really pushing here, you know, to show this. Now, let's see if the color correction does anything. Yeah, it does. It sort of adds a little too much of the red, though. Okay. Um, let me just let it come back. All right, so... So let's see if we pull this down, you'll notice that we lose some of that detail. Yeah. But we gain back some detail in the core. So it'll be a matter of just playing with this. This is beautiful. It is. This is 23 stacked, and I think we're going to stop with that. Wow. All right. Well, let's do this. Let's let's change our settings here to measure 51. Whirlpool. Oh, I already got it. Whirlpools? Who said Whirlpools? That's not right. Alright, let's get rid of that. Alright, and we're there. Okay, so now uh, we'll save this galaxy. Jeez, what a beautiful view this was. This is a great view to end the night on, don't you think? I was about to pull a mark on you. And say what what object? M101. Yeah, yeah, the pinwheel right below. Damn, I want to look at that too. Sheesh. Okay. All right, uh, just one more. Close. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, we're right there. I mean, it's right there. Right up the other side of Alcid. And the way the way the night's looking, this is a beautiful night. It'll be worth it. Yeah. Just one more, folks. And just one more. That's that's what happens here. Always do that, don't we? Okay, let's clear this guy. And then let's go bring us back to uh, our one second shot and hyper it up so we can see the finder view. And there we go. And there we are. Okay, so now M101. Darn you, Daryl. I saw it. I, I was trying to, I was trying to just put it out of my head. Now we don't need to look at it. We don't need it. Yes, we do. Of course we do. All right. So let's uh, let's go look at it. It's right here, anyway. So it's right there. Alrighty. Pinwheel, it is. This has an awful lot of beautiful uh, H2 regions in it as well. Is it going to go to Alcade or is it going to go to Mizar? Alcade. Alright, it's going to Alka Seltzer. Yeah, Michael, you're, Michael Clegg says, can't sleep under clear skies. Yeah, you know what? I can't either. You're absolutely right. I got you. Totally got you on this one. Oops. Well, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. There's another one up there. Okay. 
Okay. We'll skip through it. We're gonna ignore that one up there for now, but okay. Let's do this. Let's uh, say 25 seconds. And then do our stack. <clears throat> yeah, just catch it. We can look at it. Come back some other night and do a longer stack. Yeah, we'll More see what we get. Yeah, we'll see what we got. This is a big, beautiful face-on spiral. Yeah, it is, and it's not. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh yeah. And it's and it's not even the highest up in the sky it'll be either. Yeah. Look at that. Mm. We'll see more details. It stacks too. That. Uh, oh, you betcha. Sort of like M fifty one. You'll see that spiral arm on the left, where it's moving up toward the top. Uh, it's uh, got a big. Got no. The next one over to the left. And this it, one. At about ten o'clock. Yeah. The next arm big, out. Okay, but see right there, he's got this here. Yes. Then you got you a got, sharp crook in it right there, and then up above it. Trails like off really there. faint for long Yeah. Ways. We also have what looks like a supernova remnant in here. Michael says, Michael Clegg says he did this target himself. Said it took him uh, three hours to get enough data. Well, it. At higher focal length, it will. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, this well, is 50%. Let's go to 100. Yeah, good. You know, there's one way to get focal length and uh, keep the F ratio low. You know? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not made of money. Yeah, neither am I. <laughs> uh, what we're talking about is a large after telescope, folks. Like, uh, uh, oh, 14. I what it would take to get down to an F2 again, but uh, say to an F, F3 or F4. Yeah. We had a we had a club member years ago. He built a it was a 22 inch uh, F3, I think. Wow. That was a that was a handful of telescope. I believe it. It was portable, but uh, it was really something. Yeah, portable if you had a trailer truck. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that forty-one inch I got to look through. It was portable, supposedly, uh, but mm -hmm. it look came at this. In, it came in its own huge trailer and it had a big pickup truck pulling it around. Oh. Look at these, these, uh, these several lines. I'm not sure if those are yeah. OB associations, which are you know O and B stars forming in this distant galaxy. But if you notice these red spots in here, these are all H2 regions. Uh, and this galaxy, they're they're named because they're so prevalent, so obvious. Yeah. Look at this string of of basically Orion nebulas in here. Okay, the same thing, stellar nurseries. Um, and there's the nucleus. And yes, Isabella says what I was about to just say. She says it reminds her of the Triangulum Galaxy. Except this one, I think, is further away. Um, and the Triangulum Galaxy is only a couple million light years away. This one, uh, let's see how far this one is. This one's uh, 20 million light years away. So that's uh, quite it's distant. It's probably bigger. Yeah. The uh, the three or four dots you pointed out at about four right o'clock, right there, yeah. The brightest one and the one highest up to the right looks green to me. Yeah, it looks like it might be a supernova remnant. But you know what? Uh, we can support this now. It'll be a little blurry, but let's uh, let's go to two hundred percent and look at that. 
Wow. Yeah, definitely green, but these yeah. two are not as green. This might be a supernova remnant. You can even see some wisps. Yeah. Um, another green one to its upper right. Yeah, right there. And there's another one. Here, one here, one here. Yep. One here. A bunch of them here. That's me. Yeah. And one, there's one. I run over it. Uh, there's and one the here. Blob there to one the here. Left, uh, here? Got a big, uh, higher. Keep going. Up there? Right there. So oh, yeah. It's green, too. Yeah, that was the one I was pointing to earlier. Look at the depth and detail in these spiral arms here. Look at these beautiful dark nebulae. And there's more green here. So think of these green things possibly as veil nebulas. You know, um, the exploded remnants of a star. The blue in here are the young hot stars. They usually form in the disks and the spiral arms of the stars. Because <clears throat> that's where the compression of this material happens, where the condense, uh, condensing uh, uh, forces of gravity act the most on the mass of the galaxy. And the mass is in the spiral arms. <clears throat> so this is really just a phenomenal looking view. Yeah. <laughs> that one green one, the squiggly one up there to the upper left of the the, the nucleus. This one? That's, that's huge. Yeah, this is big. Yeah, it's big. There's a more condensed green one to the upper left of it. This one here. Up toward the top. Well, there's one there, too. Yes, and there's I one know. there. And that one. Yeah. See, we're not seeing all the spiral arms. I mean, when I do this, you're going to see it in a minute. You can even see filaments on this one. Right. And some filaments on this right there. Look at that. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this. I am going to back out and get the whole galaxy in here. All right. And now I'm going to do a push to see just how much information we can get out of here. Well, look at that. There's that other galaxy. Yep. This isn't bad, but with the push, let's let's bring some of this data out with a little bit of a, a darkening of the background. Bonnie says this galaxy feels full of life to her. I agree, Bonnie. I agree. Look at this. There's a lot going on here. Isabella says, what size of telescope it would take to see these nebulae close like the veil. Uh, will we ever be able to see them close? Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, if we use like the, the Hubble Space Telescope could probably look at some of these details. But again, uh, in order to resolve these details, we need big aperture uh, because the telescope is subject to a, a limit called the Dawes limit. And that's, that's strictly related to the size of the mirrors on the telescope. James Webb would be able to look at this galaxy and see details that Hubble cannot. And that's just not even because of the infrared, but that would probably be part of it. It's just because the uh, James Webb has uh, a lot more mirrors, has 21 feet of mirrors versus eight feet of mirrors. Look at this, this is just, I don't know, I'm getting kind of really excited about this one. Huh. What a beautiful, beautiful object. Let me turn off all enhancements for a minute. So you turn off all enhancements and then, and the nuclei show up a little bit brighter, a little bit more detailed. Um, Look at that. I, I have a Hubble image of M101 up and all those things we call green. Yeah. Uh, they're white or blue white in the Hubble image, whatever they're they? worth. Well, is it false color? Uh, no, it looks like a natural color image. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm gonna... Would you like a link to this, Mark? Yeah, sure. I'll post the link in chat. Okay. It's amazing what you're seeing, though. Okay, I just corrected the color to what I think might be, uh, what you're talking about. Yeah.
I mean, your image stands up quite well to the Hubble image. Wow, it does. Well, all right, let's... Uh, can see a lot of detail in that big knot to the left there. Okay, this is the Hubble image. This is that. Yeah, this this might be an OB association. Yeah. Yeah, which which makes sense. Oh gosh. Yeah. All right, so Isabella, you you want to know, huh? Well, look it. There you go. OB association. Hot young blue stars. And this here looks like a remnant. Definitely a supernova remnant. Oh, that, that's a barred spiral galaxy. Probably either uh, much further away. Wow. Not seen through this galaxy. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's pretty cool. And here we are doing, doing the same thing. There's the Hubble p picture, folks, if you want, want it. Well, your your image stands up quite well, really. Yeah, it does. Well, by changing the color, it actually helps. Uh, by doing the color correction, it actually helps. Yeah. We stacked 25 so far, so that's not bad. Well, see, this is the Encore image for tonight. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. It's midnight right. here. It's two for you. You want to call it a night? Yeah, I have to. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for indulging me. No, this is good. Um, you know, I'm I'm always doing just one more, and I wasn't sure whether we wanted to do the pinwheel. Look at those; those look really blue now. See that? Yeah. That color correction works well. Wow, this is. I just don't want to stop. This is. I got to though. Okay. Um, I'm gonna let one more come in. Okay. Look at that. This will be 28 stacked images here soon. That's really something. Wow. Okay. That stands up just as well as the Whirlpool does. It does. And I actually, I when I tried the world, when I tried them on a one uh, at some point in the past, it just didn't seem very good. Uh -huh. I didn't have much hope for it, to be honest. Not bad at all, though. Not bad at all. All right, well, since I'm here, I'm going to do the 30, and then I'll stop. <laughs> See, even with just one more, I do one more. Right now, we're at 29 stacked. I'm going to go to 30 even, and then stop it there and save it. Okay. All right, one second. Done. Boom. Okay. Okay. 30 images stacked. We got the right name up here, M101 Galaxy, save. So we're saving the raw file there, that's the FITS file. And then we're gonna save it exactly as seen for those that want to have this and play. There we go. And just to show you what size it is on the actual frame, let's go back to the beginning and go here and set it to auto and show you. Well, there's the full size. Okay. This haze again is the uh, flat fielding, which uh, which is working, um, but it actually it's only I have to you have to work it. You have to actually work with it. I want to see what that looks like. Let's go to a hundred percent on this now. And it's going to be over here. No, over here. All right, there it comes. Wow. That looks pretty. It does. That's really, really good. And you, know, you keep pushing like this and you get more and more brightness out of all that. Wow. Well, folks, I'll tell you, um, we have a telescope that's performing very admirably, to be honest. Very admirably. Oh, well, this will be up on the server in no time. 
you look for it it'll be there um, I want to thank you guys for coming out here tonight um, this has been a wonderful night I knew we were going to be going late tonight because uh, we start at 1030 now because that's when it gets dark and as you saw it wasn't even quite fully dark but this is all good wait till June I know yeah okay. okay well thank you for having me on Mark it was a great night tonight yeah it was it was really good got a lot of great show uh, show stuff here it was wonderful and I want to thank all you guys for coming out as well like I said so good night folks Good night to everybody that was here and hanging out with us. Isabella, thank you again for everything you're doing for us. As she points out, M101 is already up there. Very good. All right, guys. Well, you guys have a good night. And we will be back on the next clear night, I hope. So we'll see you. Good night, good night. everybody.